It started as a hobby, rigging up old ham radio equipment in my attic to scan obscure frequencies on clear nights. Most often I'd only pick up static and garbled voices cutting in and out. But one cold February night, a new signal came through, crystal clear. A sequence of musical tones, almost like a synthesized choir chanting. It repeated every few minutes, strong and purposeful. I recorded hours of it, transfixed. This was no random signal. It carried something meaningful, a clear message of some kind. I digitized the audio and ran it through decoding software to analyze the patterns. After days of work, a set of geographic coordinates emerged. To my shock, they pinpointed a remote spot less than 20 miles from my house. The signal had to be coming from there. The next morning, I hiked out to the coordinates located deep in the woods. I nearly dismissed it as just a prank when the alleged source came into view. A small ramshackle cabin stood tucked away off the trail. Was someone just broadcasting weird signals from their backwoods home? Curiosity propelled me forward, but nearing the cabin, things seemed off. Strange dish antennas, rolls of wire and other electronics cluttered the perimeter instead of firewood or tools. The windows emitted a faint blue glow. Apprehension swelled within me, but I had to see who or what was in there. I crept onto the porch and peered inside. Complex machines and panels covered every surface, flashing and beeping as abstract images raced across monitors. And working intently at a console was something I could barely comprehend. A tall, spindly being with huge, opaque eyes and pale blue skin. It took me a moment to accept that it was real and not human. I must have made a gasp because the creature's head jerked up to look right at me. I was too shocked to even panic as it moved swiftly to the door. It opened it halfway, studying me cautiously with those impenetrable black eyes. You should not be here, it finally said in a strangely resonant voice. But if you have decoded my broadcast, perhaps you can understand my situation. Please come in. Part of me wanted to bolt from this bizarre situation, but my curiosity won out. I slowly entered what I now realized was a spaceship in the guise of a cabin. The alien sat me down and offered fluid in a curious metal vessel. As I sipped the sweet libation, it began its tale. Its name was unpronounceable in my tongue, so I just called it Zarin. Many cycles ago, Zarin served as researcher on an exploratory vessel. Its crew had strict orders to covertly observe developing worlds without contact. But one day they encountered a grievous distress signal from Earth. Against protocols, they intercepted a primitive capsule hurtling through space. Inside were two distressed Earth creatures. While the creatures were safely returned, the unauthorized rescue led to disaster. Accused of dangerous cultural contamination, Zarin was exiled on this very planet, its actions sought to aid. Its crew abandoned it here over a century ago by Earth time. Zarin had been surviving in hiding, ceaselessly monitoring human airwaves to understand its caretaker's mysterious culture. My mind reeled taking all this in. Of all the backyard hobbyists to pick up its covert signal, Zarin was intrigued that I alone seemed drawn to make contact. It confessed that it had slowly been going mad from isolation and longed to make amends by using its knowledge to aid humanity. But first, it required help adapting to society. I knew then why that strange broadcast had called me so powerfully. A higher purpose had drawn me straight to this extraordinary refugee. Doing so came with great risk. Even interacting this far could be seen as treason by its people. But how could I turn away? After swearing to secrecy, I helped Zarin slowly integrate into the world. It learned English, 
adopted a human disguise and made breakthroughs in science using its advanced knowledge while living anonymously among us. My relationship to this alien will forever remain hidden, but I know humanity has gained immeasurably from Zarin's presence, even if they remain oblivious. And this remarkable being can finally share its culture's wisdom after lifetimes of silence. The radio hobby that connected us across light years of separation was no accident. I was meant to help this alien in exile find a belonging in its newfound home. Within its tale, I see hope that our differences need not divide us, that the greatest rewards come from opening our minds to possibility. Zarin gave me the universe by showing me how to more fully inhabit this single fleeting life for however long our unlikely friendship can preserve. It had been a long day at work, one of those days where every tick of the clock feels like a jab to the ribs. All I wanted was to slide into the subway seat, zone out, and make it home. The doors whooshed open, and I stepped onto the train without even glancing up from my phone. But when I did look up, the world seemed to freeze around me. Every face on the train was mine. They were all sitting there, each version of me occupying the seats, gripping the poles, even leaning against the doors. Some wore the same expression of weary fatigue that I felt. Others were engrossed in books or staring at their phones. But they were all unmistakably me. My breath hitched. Was this some elaborate prank? Virtual reality? My mind scrambled for an explanation, but came up empty. The train jolted into motion, forcing me to grab a pole for balance. My eyes darted from one face to another, each pair of eyes, my eyes, locking onto me with varying degrees of shock or curiosity. Next stop, 23rd Street, the intercom announced, but the voice was my own. The other me's began to whisper amongst themselves, each conversation like an echo chamber of my own thoughts. Words like glitch and reality floated in the air, merging into an indecipherable murmur. One version of me, seated near the door, patted the empty seat next to her. Hesitant, I walked over and sat down. Up close, I could see the tiny details that made us identical. The same mole on the chin, the same chipped nail polish. Any idea what's going on? She asked. Her voice was as familiar as my own thoughts. I was hoping you would know, I said. A heavy silence followed punctuated only by the screech of the subway against the rails. 23rd Street, exit for Chelsea and Madison Square, my voice announced through the intercom as the train pulled into the station. The doors opened, but no one moved. Who would? Stepping off this train felt like stepping off the edge of reality. The doors closed, and the train moved on. As the minutes ticked by, the atmosphere grew tense. Some of my clones began to pace the car. Others were in heated discussions, gesturing wildly. A few even seemed to be in tears. We were a microcosm of emotions, each one amplified by its reflection in the others. Next stop, into the line, the intercom said. That wasn't right. There should have been at least three more stops before the terminus. A collective sense of dread filled the car. The train pulled into an unlit station, the walls of which were pure black, as if they were made from darkness itself. The doors opened. On the platform stood another version of me, her eyes filled with a calm, almost serene authority. She spoke without boarding the train. This is where you get off, all of you. This is the end of the line. The other me's began to exit the train. I followed suit stepping onto the dark platform. It was cold here, as if the very air was devoid of life. Is this... what is this place? I asked the version of me on the platform. She looked at me, her eyes like bottomless wells. It's a nowhere place between the cracks of reality, she said. 
And now that you're here, there's something you all need to do. And what's that? I asked. Choose. Choose what? Who gets to go back? A hushed silence descended on the platform. Go back? Go back to what? To being the only one? The only me? Only one can return, she continued. The rest will stay here, in the nowhere place. Arguments erupted around me. How do you fight for your own life against yourself? How do you prove you're the real one when everyone is a perfect copy? Then it hit me. The coat I was wearing, a new purchase just this morning, a coat none of the others wore. It was a small detail, but in a situation where everything was an echo, it made me the original. I stepped forward. I'm the one who should go back. I'm wearing a coat none of you have. It proves I'm the original. The authoritative me looked at me, her eyes softening. Very well, she said, and with a wave of her hand, the world around me started to dissolve in a swirl of colors. When I came to, I was back on the train, pulling into my regular stop. This time, the faces around me were their usual mix of strangers. Trembling, I exited the train and climbed up the stairs to the street level. As I reached the top, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number flashed on the screen. It read, Nice coat. It suits you well. I looked around, my eyes scanning the crowd. Then, I saw her, a few yards away, disappearing into the throng of people. Me, wearing the exact same coat, her eyes meeting mine one last time before she was swallowed by the city. Back in the day, my job was at a rural elementary school, teaching a bunch of first and second graders. Little humans full of energy and imagination. That's why, at first, I didn't give too much credence to their chatter about the silver ball in the sky during recess. Kids have vivid imaginations, after all. But the consistency of their stories had an unnerving edge. They all talked about how the ball hovered, silent, and then zipped away at an angle that no airplane could manage. But kids will be kids, and I put it out of my mind, until art class the following week. The assignment was simple. Draw something you saw this week that made you happy. Standard fare to let them express themselves. As they eagerly scratched away with their crayons, I walked among them, offering the occasional praise or guidance. That's when I saw the first drawing. Alien creatures with large eyes, elongated limbs, standing beside what was unmistakably a saucer-shaped object. I frowned, but before I could ask about it, I saw another drawing. A different child, a different part of the room, but the same entities, the same saucer. My stomach tightened as I hurriedly scanned the room. There were 14 students, and by the time I had made my circuit, I counted no less than eight drawings depicting the same beings next to similar UFOs. Each was rendered in the childish scrawl of crayon, but the uniformity was chilling. Trying to maintain composure, I asked the class, Wow, you guys really let your imaginations run wild, huh? Can anyone tell me more about these space friends? One of the boys, Jeremy, piped up. They're not from our imaginations, Miss Simmons. They're from the playground. They waved at us. The room seemed to shrink, walls closing in as other kids nodded in agreement. They had long fingers, added Lisa, another student. They didn't talk, but I heard them in my head. They said they're just visiting. My throat felt like sandpaper. I encouraged the children to explain more, grasping for some plausible explanation, maybe a shared dream or some group fantasy. But their accounts were stark in their agreement. 
down to the details like the way their space friends floated rather than walked. How their mouths didn't move, but thoughts were implanted directly into their minds. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those crayon drawings, the long limbs, the big eyes, the saucer-like crafts. I found myself wrestling with the absurdity and the terror of it. How could children, at their level of emotional and cognitive development, construct such a consistent, intricate falsehood? Plus, none of them knew I was going to give them that assignment, and all of them, without really looking at each other, drew the same thing. By morning, my decision was made. I gathered the drawings and took them to the principal. Mr. Jacobs didn't know whether to laugh or call for a psych evaluation of his teaching staff. Yet, his eyes narrowed as he looked through the stack of drawings. This is... unusual, he finally said, in a voice that betrayed an unease he didn't want to acknowledge. Parents were called, meetings were held. Officially, the incident was chalked up to mass hysteria fueled by childish imagination. The art assignment was repeated a week later, this time yielding an assortment of family portraits, pets, and superheroes. No saucers, no extraterrestrial beings with elongated limbs and large eyes. But something had shifted, something intangible. Recess became a quieter affair. The kids clustered together more closely, their laughter a bit more subdued, their glances toward the sky more frequent. In staff meetings, the event turned into an inside joke, a way for overworked educators to lighten the mood. But not for me. I couldn't shake the conviction that something extraordinary had touched the lives of those children, leaving a mark on their consciousness that wasn't going to leave anytime soon. As for me, I found myself scanning the skies more often, at recess, on my drive home, from my backyard, looking for something I couldn't define, couldn't dismiss. I never saw anything, but the search itself became a ritual, a silent vigil fueled by a mystery that refused to be forgotten. The years passed, the kids moved on. I eventually left the teaching profession, driven by a need for change, a need to explore beyond the boundaries of a rural schoolyard. But those drawings remain with me, filed away, yet never far from thought, a haunting mosaic of crayon and mystery, of innocence touched by the inexplicable. And as each day ends, as I find myself inevitably drawn to the horizon where sky meets earth, I am reminded of the questions that still linger, unanswered, in the echoing silence of a playground forever changed. I was never a fan of long-haul flights, hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean, an island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. 
I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch or... The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat, eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. There were no signs of human life, no structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant, those questions hovered in the thick, humid air, unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar, the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did. Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work, until I started noticing the faces. 
The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks. A man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. But I told myself it was just stress, lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered, doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors, faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets, faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools. Always when I was alone, always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor, was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. Dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice, or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place and not me. Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting. 
wondering what I'm going to do next. I had just settled into my comfy sofa, the long day's tension still clinging to my muscles. My hand found the remote, eager for some mind-numbing television. I pressed the power button and the screen flickered to life. What I saw made my heart drop into my stomach. There, on the screen, was me, or someone who looked exactly like me. Same hair, same eyes, same nervous habit of tucking a strand of hair behind an ear. She was in a well-furnished kitchen, laughing with children who looked a lot like how I'd imagined my own kids to look. Confused, I jabbed the channel up button. The scene shifted. There I was again, this time in a business suit, shaking hands with another woman in what appeared to be a swanky office. Channel after channel, the story was the same. My mimics living out countless lives, each more divergent from my own. I watched myself as a firefighter, a surgeon, a painter, a prisoner, all coexisting within the confines of the glowing screen. My mind reeled. This couldn't be real. Was my TV hacked? Was it some kind of prank? A marketing stunt for a new reality show? But as I looked closer, I realized that each version of me was subtly different. Distinct expressions, unique body language, varying tones of voice. These weren't cheap manipulations or deep fakes. They were living, breathing iterations of myself, unaware that they were being broadcast to an audience of one. The original, the outlier, the fake. I didn't know what to call myself anymore. Frantic, I grabbed my phone snapping pictures of each channel as if collecting evidence of a crime I couldn't yet comprehend. I sent a few to my sister Jenna, waiting anxiously for her response. Are you playing some weird game with me? She texted back. No, I replied, my fingers trembling over the screen. This is happening right now. I'm freaking out. Her reply took longer this time. All I see are regular channels, Nora. News, sitcoms, documentaries. Are you sure you're okay? I wasn't sure. Not anymore. As days passed, I couldn't bring myself to turn off the TV. I was drawn to it, compelled to witness these alternate lives unfold. They were hauntingly fascinating, but also deeply disturbing. What did they mean? Were they alternate realities, glimpses into parallel universes where other versions of myself existed? And why was I the only one seeing them? My life began to unravel. Sleep became a distant memory, meals forgotten, social commitments ignored. The TV was a puzzle I couldn't solve, its enigmatic channels a labyrinth I couldn't escape. And then one evening, something changed. I flicked through the channels again, my eyes red, my attention wandering despite myself. And I stopped. There I was, or she was, rather, sitting on a similar sofa in a similar room. Her eyes met mine, a flash of recognition, or was it confusion, passing through them. For a brief moment, our lives converged. We were the same person, separated only by the glass of the television screen and whatever inexplicable force had entangled our realities. Then she did something I didn't expect. She picked up a remote and pressed a button. My screen went black. I sat there, stunned. My fingers trembled as they aimed the remote at the dark screen. Hesitant, I pressed the power button. Regular channels greeted me. News, sitcoms, documentaries. It was over but the implications were not lost on me. That version of myself, that other Nora, had somehow ended the broadcast. She had the power to switch off her TV, and in doing so, switch off mine, to disconnect our entangled lives. I still don't know how or why it happened, and each time I turn on my television, 
I do so with a mixture of dread and anticipation, wondering if the fractured broadcast will return and what it would mean if it does. I've gone back to my normal life, but the questions remain. Was I a spectator or was I part of the spectacle? Did I witness a glitch in reality or was I the glitch? Sometimes, late at night when the world is quiet and still, I swear I can feel the eyes of the other Noras out there, all of us connected yet isolated, each pondering the same unsettling thought. When we looked through that screen, were we staring into a distorted mirror or peering through a window to somewhere else? And if we were, what would happen if one day that window were to suddenly shatter? I can only wonder and keep wondering as I aim the remote at the TV and press the power button, my finger hesitating for just a moment longer each time. Waking up that morning felt like emerging from a nightmare, but the terror didn't end with consciousness. I blinked my eyes open to a room transformed. The walls of my bedroom were etched with symbols, alien, incomprehensible marks that glowed faintly in the early morning light. My heart pounded. This was no prank. I live alone, secure in a third floor apartment with a digital lock. Scanning the room, everything else was untouched. My phone on the nightstand, clothes tossed casually on the chair. Even a small pile of books seemed as undisturbed as ever. Only the walls bore these disquieting scars. I got up, my feet hitting the cold floor as I approached one of the symbols. Up close, the markings looked almost organic a series of intertwining shapes that seemed to shift when I wasn't looking directly at them. I reached out to touch one, and the moment my fingers brushed against it, a jolt of icy dread ran down my spine. Instantly, I withdrew my hand, my skin tingling, as if the walls themselves had warned me to keep my distance. The day unfolded in a haze. I snapped photos of the walls and sent them to a friend who dabbled in linguistics and cryptography. Any idea what these are? I texted. Hours later, a reply. Never seen anything like it. Are you sure it's not just some avant-garde art? It was no art. As night fell, my apartment grew unnaturally cold, and the symbols seemed to pulsate, as if drawing energy from the darkness. I wrapped myself in a blanket and sat on the bed, my eyes darting from one glowing mark to the next. And that's when I heard it. A whisper so soft it was almost drowned out by the hum of the refrigerator from the kitchen. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, unintelligible but filled with a foreboding urgency. Then my phone buzzed. An email, the sender's address a jumble of characters and numbers, the subject line consisting of the same alien symbols that adorned my walls. I opened it, my hands trembling. The email contained only a single line of text, but it was in plain English. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. Preparation for what? Suddenly, the lights flickered. The room plunged into darkness for a moment before the power returned but something had changed. The symbols on the walls were now glowing brighter, a radiant azure that cast eerie shadows on the furniture, and they were moving. Not just shifting subtly as before, but truly moving, rearranging themselves into a new pattern. Before my eyes, they converged toward a single point on the wall the shapes merging into one large, complex symbol that seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. The dread that had been my constant companion now escalated into raw fear. I grabbed my coat and keys, my instincts screaming at me to get out. As I reached for the doorknob, I heard the whisper again, louder this time, almost a growl. 
a guttural sequence of sounds that reverberated in the air and within my own skull. I pulled open the door, fleeing into the corridor without a second glance back. But even as I pounded down the stairs and burst into the night, I knew escape was not that simple. My walls had become a canvas for something beyond my understanding, a message or a warning from entities unknown. The symbols are still there, haunting my dreams and my waking moments. I've tried painting over them, but they bleed through, their glow undiminished. Friends have come over, offering theories and potential solutions. Everything from sage smudging to contacting paranormal investigators. But none have dared to touch the glyphs. I now sleep with the lights on, an uneasy truce with the incomprehensible. But the email haunts me, those words a constant echo. Do not resist, preparation is complete. And the same question lingers, preparation for what? The dread remains, an eternal undercurrent to my existence. I'm caught in a web of cosmic forces, a pawn in a game with rules I can't fathom. Every morning I wake to those walls, the symbols a constant reminder of my entanglement in something far larger and more terrifying than I'd ever imagined. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear whispers, new sounds, new sequences, each more urgent than the last. I can't shake the feeling that something is coming, something momentous and irrevocable. But what it is, and what role these alien glyphs have in it, remains maddeningly, terrifyingly unclear. A glance out the window, a double take, and then dread settled like a cold stone in my stomach. Overnight, a crop circle had appeared in my backyard. It wasn't the hasty work of pranksters, but a design intricate in detail and precise in its geometry. Circular patterns interlocked with arcane symbols, etched into the tall grass as if by an unseen hand. How? Why? Questions tumbled through my mind as I stood there, coffee mug forgotten on the kitchen counter. My backyard was enclosed, no signs of entry or exit. It was as if the formation had materialized out of thin air. That was just the beginning. Small oddities followed, electronic glitches, lights flickering on and off, inexplicable shadows skimming past windows. I found my dog, Max, staring at the crop circle for hours, as if captivated by something I couldn't see. At night, a low-frequency hum resonated from the ground, growing louder near the center of the formation. By the third day, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I decided to investigate, grabbing a flashlight and a notebook, a feeble attempt to document whatever I might find. As I stepped into the circle, the air grew dense. The normal sounds of the evening, crickets, the rustle of leaves, drowned out by a pulsating vibration that seemed to emanate from the earth itself. Drawn to the circle's center, I felt my pulse quicken, my senses sharpen. And then it happened. Each symbol within the formation lit up, one by one, as if activated by my presence. The lines glowed a ghostly blue, a luminous web stretching out in all directions. A chill crawled up my spine. I was no longer alone. Peripheral vision caught figures standing just beyond the circle, silhouettes barely discernible in the dim light. They were tall, slender, almost humanoid, but not quite. Their forms wavered, as if composed of light and shadow, their eyes fixed upon me. Telepathically, a message entered my mind, bypassing language and lodging itself directly into my understanding. Pattern, conduit, obligation. The words were disjointed, fragments of concepts too vast for my comprehension. 
I felt a sudden surge of emotion, confusion, awe, a piercing sense of urgency. My gaze was pulled upward, where a shimmering distortion appeared in the sky, an oscillating tear in the fabric of reality itself. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the figures vanished. The glow subsided, the crop circle returning to its inert state, the night swallowing whatever forces had just been at play. But the tear in the sky remained, a barely visible ripple, like a cosmic bruise. I retreated back to my house, the weight of the encounter settling in. Sleep came hard that night, interrupted by flashes of what had transpired, figures beyond human description concepts my mind struggled to grasp. But one thing was clear. Whatever had occurred was beyond me, perhaps beyond humanity itself. Days turned to weeks, and the crop circle eventually faded, the grass reclaiming its natural state. But the strange occurrences didn't stop. Objects around the house moved of their own accord, as if displaced by invisible hands. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I'd hear whispers, indistinct murmurs that echoed in my ears long after they had ceased. The tear in the sky became a permanent fixture, occasionally visible when conditions were just right. I found myself drawn to it, a magnet pulling at some innate sense of destiny or doom. And the words, the disjointed message received from those otherworldly beings, played on repeat in my mind. Pattern conduit, obligation. I became obsessed, sketching the crop circle's design over and over, each stroke of the pencil amplifying the hum that still resonated from the ground, as if the paper itself had become a conduit. But a conduit for what? And what was this obligation they spoke of? As days pass, the anticipation thickens. Something is coming something far beyond my understanding. The crop circle was not an end, but a beginning. A doorway, a portal, a breach between their world and mine. And now, every night, as I stare up at the sky, at the tear that remains and seems to grow ever so slightly, I can't shake the feeling that whatever it is, whatever is waiting on the other side, it's getting closer. The long stretch of midnight highway unfurled before me as I drove through the rugged countryside. This desolate road was a shortcut to my destination, but my grip tightened on the wheel as local legends surfaced in my mind. Locals had spoken of this highway's hauntings, phantoms who preyed upon lost travelers. I tried to shake off my nerves. Ghost stories were merely fiction after all. But alone on this forgotten route, I could not ignore the chill creeping down my spine. My headlights illuminated a battered sign, Scenic Route 7. This remote byway was said to be plagued by a variety of supernatural horrors. In Ireland, nearly identical roads held the same name and tales of spirits known as Wailing Women, their shrieks echoing as they searched eternally for their lost children. In Japan, an analogous winding highway crossed the forest of Aokigahara, infamous for its yurei, ghosts of the forgotten. But the local legend that unnerved me most centered around a phantom hitchhiker. Stories told of a young woman dressed in white standing on the roadside, silently begging for a ride. Any driver who dared stop for her soon disappeared, never to be seen again. My gaslight suddenly blinked on and my stomach dropped. I was running low on fuel, still miles from civilization. With no choice, I kept driving down the pitch black road. The rocky cliffs around me seemed to close in as a dense fog rolled across my path. I could barely see ahead when through the mist, I spotted a faded sign for a gas station. Grateful, I veered off towards the weathered building. 
Perhaps they still provided services to wayward travelers like myself. But as I pulled up, not a light shone in the decrepit station. A rusty old pump stood unused amidst weeds. Everything about the place screamed abandonment, except for one detail, a yellow payphone under an overhanging roof. Could it possibly still work? Worth a try, since my cell had no signal. I dug for loose change in my glove box and walked over. The payphone's cracked receiver felt heavy and cold in my hand. I lifted it to my ear, deposited my coins, and miraculously heard a dial tone. Quickly I punched 911, seeking aid, or at least directions. One ring, then two. Suddenly a girl's voice answered, her tone strange and distant. Please, help me. I jumped, taken aback. I cautiously asked who was speaking, but she only replied again, now clearly desperate. Please, you must help. He's coming. Her plea sent a chill through me, but I pressed for details. Where was she? What was happening? The voice grew fainter, as if speaking from the end of a long tunnel. Her last words sank my heart. He's here. He's... Then only static. I slammed the receiver down, breathing fast. This was no 911 call. Dread flooded my veins at the implication. Somehow I had connected directly with the ghost girl hitchhiker herself, calling across dimensions for aid. I ran back to my car, throwing it into gear. Peeling out back onto the road, I pushed the gas pedal to the floor. But only minutes later, through my headlights piercing the night mist, a shadow took shape. The silhouette of a young woman emerged. My blood turned to ice. It was her. The phantom wore a gossamer white dress, raven hair flowing untamed over her face. She stood utterly still, thumb outraised. Every fiber of my being screamed not to stop. But her form drew closer in my high beams, her thumb still desperately lifted. Against all reason, I pulled over, though never stopping fully. Perhaps I could help free her spirit. She floated to my passenger window, peering in. And then I saw her face, skin paler than snow, eyes jet black and devoid of life. Her beauty was chilling, otherworldly. This was no trapped soul, but something far more sinister. Ancient instinct took over, and I floored the gas. The phantom smile stretched unnaturally wide as I left her behind, fading back into the fog. I raced onwards, pursued only by my pounding heart. Local legends were true. This was a haunted highway, stalked by a deceiving, vengeful ghost. I dared not glance back to see if she followed still. Only the road ahead mattered now. I drove until I reached the highway's end, where it rejoined the main interstate. The disappeared into dawn's first light. But I know I'll never take the haunted detour of Road 7 again. For some journeys lead places from which we can never return, waylaid forever by the spirits that walk our darkest byways. My telescope was my sanctuary, a way to escape the mundane things of the terrestrial and gaze into the celestial realm. A clear night, no clouds to obstruct the sky's panorama of stars. Comfortably seated in my backyard, I peered through the lens, losing myself in the choreography of constellations and planets. But that night, something interrupted the familiar tableau. My eyes widened as I caught sight of it. A collection of lights, unlike any aircraft or satellite. I adjusted the telescope's focus, my breath caught between fascination and a prickling sense of unease. They were there, a fleet of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, shimmering orbs of light moving in patterns too purposeful to be random. A celestial dance of sorts, complex maneuvers executed with a precision that defied explanation. 
My heart drummed a rapid beat in my chest. This was unprecedented, something even the most avid sky watchers could only dream of witnessing. And yet, the reality of it left me filled with an eerie discomfort. They didn't just hover, they moved in intricate spirals, forming shapes and splitting apart only to reconfigure moments later, as if performing, but for whom? My eyes stayed glued to the telescope, my hand reaching involuntarily to adjust the lens for a closer look. As I zoomed in, one of the objects broke away from the formation and seemed to pause, as if becoming aware of my scrutiny. A chill ran through me, a shiver that told me this was no ordinary observation. My fingers tightened around the telescope's frame, knuckles white. The rogue object pulsated, its light intensifying as it moved in a path that felt dangerously purposeful. My heart sank as I realized it was coming toward Earth, toward me. An unshakable sense of dread gripped me. I was no longer a passive observer, but somehow involved in this cosmic ballet. I stepped back, leaving the telescope pointed skyward its lens capturing the last vestiges of a scene I could no longer bear to watch. I turned to go inside, my steps quickening as I moved away from the uncertainty above. But just as I reached the door, a brilliant flash lit up the yard, so bright it cast stark shadows against the walls. I froze, my body refusing to move as I sensed, more than saw, a presence descend into my backyard. Summoning courage, I turned around. The object had landed, or perhaps materialized, its form an opaque sphere hovering inches above the ground. Its surface was a translucent membrane, pulsating like a living organism, emitting a strange glow. And then it spoke, not in words, but in thoughts a telepathic resonance that filled the air and penetrated my consciousness. Observer observed, roles reversed, change initiated. The message, or warning, disappeared as quickly as it arrived, leaving a void filled only by the night's ambient sounds. The object's light dimmed, and with a sudden acceleration that defied physics, it shot up into the sky rejoining the celestial formation as if it had never left. I stood there, my body numb, my mind a storm of unanswered questions and unvoiced fears. The sky returned to its familiar state, a vast expanse punctuated by stars and planets, as if the night's extraordinary events had simply never transpired at all. But something had changed both out there and within me. The dread lingered, a dark cloud overshadowing the awe. The message, its implications unfathomable, remained in my thoughts. Change initiated. I've returned to the telescope night after night, scanning the skies for another glimpse of the unexplained. But the celestial dance has vanished, leaving only the regular occupants of the night sky. Still, a sense of anticipation haunts me, a foreboding that I can't shake. The message reverberates in my subconscious as I search the stars, a cosmic echo that hints at a future yet to unfold. What change has been initiated, and what role do I have to play in this unfathomable script? I gaze upwards and for the first time find no comfort in the stars. Instead, each twinkling point of light feels like a watching eye, and I can't help but wonder if somewhere out there, they are still observing, still dancing, still preparing for whatever change is yet to come. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage, tucked away in the rural backroads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, 
the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person. A cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem, when Emma made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them. From the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted, feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception, isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind, now a gnawing concern. The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains, casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood, coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head, ignore it and hope it goes away, or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. Enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it, my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone, she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied, unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. Our host sent us a message later, asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds, but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. 
He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others, crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning, but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed, but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. My friends screamed and fled in all directions into the trees. I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beast's bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth, and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed or to go anywhere near those woods again. Antarctica is not a place for the faint-hearted. It's a vast expanse where white and silence bleed into each other, 
rendering the landscape a blank canvas on which the mind can paint its deepest fears. As a research meteorologist stationed in McMurdo, I have braved conditions that would break a lesser soul. Howling winds, endless darkness, and temperatures that can freeze a man's spirit as easily as his flesh. But it's not the harshness of the climate that unnerves me. It's the whispers that come with the snowstorms. They're more than just auditory hallucinations. They've saved lives, including my own. You don't speak of them openly, those whispers. Antarctica has a way of humbling you, of making human words seem inadequate against its majestic and cruel indifference. But among the crew, we all know. When the snowstorms hit and the whispers come, you listen. It happened during a routine data collection mission. The sky had already turned an ominous gray, a storm brewing on the horizon, but we thought we'd have enough time. We thought wrong. Within minutes, visibility dropped to near zero, the snow a white haze that erased the distinction between earth and sky. The icy wind howled like a feral beast, gnawing through layers of thermal clothing. And then, through the cacophony, I heard it. A whisper so faint it could have been mistaken for a figment of my imagination. Left, it breathed, an ethereal wisp of sound snatched away by the gusts. My instincts screamed against it. Left would take us farther away from base, but something about that whisper felt different, like a thread of warmth woven into the frozen air. I looked at my fellow researcher, her eyes wide, her lips quivering with unspoken recognition. Did you hear it too? I mouthed. She nodded. Against reason, against logic, we veered left. The snow deepened each step an effort that seemed to drain years from our lives. The whisper persisted, guiding us through the storm as if an invisible hand was carving out a path for us to follow. Straight, it beckoned. Right, it urged, each direction accompanied by a growing sense of urgency. After what seemed an eternity, the tempest began to recede as if the elements had decided we'd earned our reprieve. Ahead of us, barely visible through the lifting mist, was the outline of an old supply cache. Forgotten by time but marked on no current map, it offered temporary refuge and, crucially, a radio. By the time we were rescued, the storm had unleashed its full fury on our original path. Had we not veered left when we did, we would have walked straight into an ice crevasse, an abyss hidden by the snow, our bodies forever entombed in Antarctic white. No one spoke of the whispers after that, but sometimes, in the middle of a snowstorm, when human voices are drowned by nature's roar, I'd catch Sarah's eye and see reflected there the inexplicable. It's as if Antarctica itself reached out to guide us through its icy maze, as if the very air we breathed bore messages from an unknown sender. Does it make me question the science I've dedicated my life to? The empirical reality I thought I knew? No, but it makes me wonder about the hidden dimensions of the world. The inexplicable phenomena that lie just beyond our understanding. In the realm of Antarctic white, where the line between life and death is as thin as the edge of a razor, those whispers are a reminder of our vulnerability, our insignificance in the grand scheme. Yet they're also a testament to the enduring mysteries of the world, unquantifiable threads that weave their way through the tapestry of human experience. And it's in that delicate balance between knowing and not knowing that I find my humility, my awe, and the endless fuel for the questions that drive us forward into the unknown. from Northern British Columbia, Canada. 
A few years ago, my friend invited me to join him, his mother, and sister at a resort beside a lake roughly 90 minutes from our town. This trip occurred at the cusp of June and July. Now, I term it a resort because while it has a primary log building, which functions as both a check-in spot and a restaurant, it's mostly just a collection of log cabins with spaces near the lake for RVs. So, resort is in very heavy air quotes. The location is predominantly surrounded by expansive forests, with the only real disruption being the highway that slices through the woods. Despite a few scattered houses around the lake, it's generally a quiet area, unless it's a holiday weekend. A winding road connects the cabins to the main building, which is a brief five to eight minute walk. Beyond the main structure, there is a clearing with tables, seemingly untouched for a decade given the overgrown vegetation around them. A short distance from these tables, within the woods, lie two lagoons encircled by an old wire fence. We arrived in the evening, familiarized ourselves with our cozy log cabin, and began exploring. The first day was fairly uneventful, but the next day's overcast and rainy weather was surprisingly welcome. It ensured fewer visitors, granting us more freedom. Our explorations led us to the clearing with the old tables, which clearly hadn't been used in ages given the encroaching nature. Delving further, about 50 feet into the woods, we discovered the lagoons. An intriguing detail was a section of the wire fence, flattened as if a large animal had passed over it. We nonchalantly dismissed it and continued our exploration, intending to return later. However, our next visit was cut short by strange noises, reminiscent of footsteps from the previous day's path. This experience kept us on edge, but we rationalized that it might just be the local wildlife. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, we even ventured to another forested spot near the cabins, where, oddly enough, we heard echoes of our own actions. It was like somebody mimicking our branch-breaking sounds. This was even more unsettling when we realized the unlikelihood of another person being in that same remote spot. Later that evening, our attempts to recreate the sounds were interrupted by a strange and frightening sight, a shadowy figure hiding behind a tree. Panic took over and we fled back to our cabin. That night's discussion was more sober as we tried to make sense of the figure and the sounds. Fast forward a year and we were back, this time with an additional friend. We briefed him about our prior adventures, which he met with skepticism. Yet the ensuing days made a believer out of him. Our encounters this time were mostly around the lagoon area. We again heard the footsteps, and on our last day, a terrifying, indescribable screech. Investigating, we were met with a sudden, massive sound of something heavy hitting the ground. We fled in terror, only to later encounter a black bear which, to our astonishment, seemed just as afraid and bolted away. It wasn't afraid of us, either. It was running from the direction where we had just had our encounter. It barely even looked at us. As I contemplate revisiting this year, I recount this story to seek insights. Two distinct entities seem to reside there. The elusive woodsman or tree knocker and the aggressive entity that we have dubbed the Screecher. Despite scouring the internet, I have found no similar experiences. Does anybody have insights or theories about these mysterious presences? The location, despite its oddities, is genuinely picturesque and offers great amenities. It's known as a Purden Lake Resort, with a notable green roof. Anyway, I welcome any theories about what might be lurking there.
You ever wake up with a sense of wrongness? I'm talking about that tingle at the base of your spine, a ghostly finger tracing the vertebrae. The day I found the crop circles in my field, that's exactly how I felt. Morning sun, already blistering, beat down on my face as I opened the front door. Coffee in hand, I surveyed the land. It's wheat season. Golden stalks, ready for harvest, stretched toward the horizon. Yet there was a flaw in this otherwise perfect tableau. Patterns in the field caught my eye. Precise geometric circles pressed into the wheat, like a godly thumbprint in the soil. I ran back inside, grabbing my drone from the den. It was an old model, but functional. Within minutes, the drone hovered above the field, sending back video footage. I stared at my tablet screen, disbelieving. Complex and intricate designs sprawled across the field, almost like Mayan or Aztec glyphs. Perfect circles connected by lines, like constellations, with tangential shapes that seemed almost mathematical. This wasn't the work of bored teenagers. The designs were too elaborate, too precise. I decided to take a closer look. Climbing into my pickup, I drove along the dirt road parallel to the field. Up close, the circles were even more baffling. The stalks were bent, not broken, leaning at acute angles to form the patterns. No human footprint, no tire track, nothing to indicate how these formations came to be. Throughout the day, neighbors and even folks from town showed up. Speculations abounded, ranging from pranksters with boards and ropes to weird weather phenomena. Old man Gary from the next farm over muttered about ley lines and energy vortices, which nobody took seriously. As night approached, a deep unease settled over me. That sense of wrongness from the morning, it was now an itch I couldn't scratch. Something compelled me to stay up, to keep a vigil over the field. With the coffee pot at my side, I parked my pickup at the edge of the field. Headlights dimmed, engine off. Hours crawled by. The night was unsettlingly silent. Even the crickets hesitated to break the stillness. The sky was overcast, stars and moon hidden behind a shroud of clouds. Just past midnight, the unnatural silence was shattered by a low hum, vibrating the very air around me. I peered into the gloom. There, emerging from the cloudy sky, was a series of lights, softly glowing orbs descending toward the field. They moved in synchronized fluidity, like schools of fish in water, only this was midair. I dared not move dared not even breathe loudly. The orbs hovered over the crop circles, casting eerie lights over the geometric designs. The low hum escalated into a pulsating rhythm, and I felt it in my bones, a resonating frequency that clashed with the core of my being. Then, as abruptly as they appeared, the orbs ascended, disappearing into the cloud cover. In the aftermath, I felt a lingering sense of violation, as if the land itself had been desecrated. I returned home, drained and weary. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with restless dreams of labyrinthine patterns and unending voids. Morning light offered no solace. The circles remained, unchanged, untouched since yesterday's discovery. No one had seen the orbs but me, and I knew better than to talk about it. Sometimes ignorance is a comfort you offer to others, a protective barrier against the incomprehensible. But deep down, I knew that whatever created those circles, whatever those orbs were, was beyond our understanding, and it had left its mark upon the land.
The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Pocomoonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents, and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise, a low rumble like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could, a shared encounter with the unexplained, forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore. Because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation, something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. It was just another weekend fishing trip, 
the boat slicing through the ocean's surface, the sky above cloudless and blue. Hours slipped by, marked only by the gentle bobbing of the boat and the intermittent tug of a fishing line. It was tranquil, a peaceful solitude that one could only find miles away from shore. But then the sea changed. The water's surface rippled and churned, as though agitated by some unseen force. My boat trembled, vibrating in a way that defied the natural movement of waves. And then it lifted, actually lifted, rising out of the water as if caught in the grip of an invisible hand. Panic clawed at my mind. I clung to the boat's sides, my eyes widening in disbelief as it continued to ascend. Higher and higher until I was enveloped in a dense mist, so thick it swallowed everything. The sea below, the sky above, the horizon in all directions. When the mist cleared, I was no longer in the ocean I knew. I found myself in a realm both surreal and otherworldly. The water below was a hue I couldn't describe, a blend of colors not present in our spectrum, shifting and shimmering in a hypnotic dance. And I wasn't alone. Aquatic beings circled my boat, their forms graceful yet alien. Scaled and sleek, with appendages that suggested both fins and limbs, their eyes glinting with an intelligence that was undoubtedly sentient. They seemed to communicate with each other in a series of melodic whistles and clicks, their movements synchronized in a manner that suggested purpose and understanding. As I watched them, captivated yet fearful, one of the beings broke away from the group and approached me. It hovered near the boat, its eyes locking onto mine. And then, with a startling clarity, a voice entered my mind. A telepathic message, formed of words yet beyond language. Observe. Do not interfere. The words were firm, commanding, and left no room for misunderstanding. Then the being turned and led the others away, diving into the depths disappearing into the alien waters. Shaken, I grasped the boat's edge, my fingers gripping the wood as if it were my only anchor to reality. What had just happened? What was this place? Questions whirled through my mind, each unanswered as I sat adrift in this realm. But then, just as suddenly as it had lifted, the boat descended. The mist returned, thicker than before, obscuring everything. When it finally cleared, I was back in familiar waters, the coastline visible in the distance. I steered the boat back to shore, my hands shaking, my mind struggling to process the experience. When I finally reached solid ground, I checked my fishing gear. Among the nets and tackle, I found a scale, a single iridescent scale unlike that of any fish. It shimmered with the same indescribable colors I had seen in that other sea. I kept the scale in a locked box, tangible proof that what I experienced was real. But sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear it. A faint melody of whistles and clicks, as if carried by the wind. And when I sleep, I dream of that aquatic realm, those beings forever etched into my subconscious. Did they bring me there to observe, to bear witness to their existence? Or was it a warning, a signal to never venture too far into the depths? I don't know. What I do know is that the ocean no longer feels the same. When I look out at the vast expanse of water, I can't shake the feeling that something out there is watching, waiting. And the scale in that locked box, it still shimmers its colors ever shifting, as if resonating with a realm far beyond our understanding. It first appeared 10 miles in just beyond a bend in the trail where the pine trees grew thick enough to turn daylight into dusk. 
a small wooden totem figure, weathered but intricately carved, a fusion of animal shapes and human faces, staked into the ground like a miniature sentry. I figured it was a trail marker or a backpacker's forgotten memento, so I took a photo and moved on. Another five miles later, there it was again. Same totem, same details, same inscrutable expression on its carved face. I picked it up, half expecting it to be the same one I'd seen earlier, as if I'd somehow looped back on myself. But my GPS showed a straight trajectory, and I knew the trail well enough to rule out accidental backtracking. An odd coincidence, surely. I left it where I found it, suppressing the nagging feeling that the forest had grown quieter, as if holding its breath. The third time left no room for coincidences. Seventeen miles into the hike, after crossing a stream that wasn't even on the map, the totem reappeared. The forest canopy seemed darker than before, the air thick with a silence that drowned even the rustling leaves. I looked over my shoulder, half expecting to catch someone trailing me, but the path behind was empty, holding on to its secrets like a miser clutching gold. I pocketed the totem this time, its wooden surface cool to the touch. It weighed more than its size suggested, like it carried a gravity all its own. It was just wood and carving, I told myself. The work of an artist messing with hikers, or maybe a series of similar markers from a local tribe. And yet, as I stowed it away, I couldn't shake the sense that I'd just accepted a challenge, or maybe a dare. With the totem in my backpack, the trail seemed to shift in subtle ways. The bird song turned discordant. The roots and rocks seemed to rearrange themselves underfoot. I'd been on this trail half a dozen times, but the familiarity had worn thin, leaving me to navigate an uncanny version of a place I thought I knew. My watch beeped, the end of another mile, but when I looked down, the totem was there again. Right on the trail, its carved eyes aimed straight at me. The impossibility of the situation stabbed at my rational mind. I unzipped my bag. The earlier totem was still there, so now there were two, identical down to the minutest detail. A thought invaded my mind like a whispered suggestion. Leave the trail, step into the woods, go where the path leads you. I fought against it, but the thought persisted, echoing louder with each step, as if the forest itself was urging me to stray. I stopped, taking deep breaths to center myself. I was the intruder here, a transient trespasser in a world that danced to ancient rhythms. My eyes scanned the darkened woods around me, half expecting them to part and reveal. What? An answer? A revelation? Finally, I placed both totems side by side on a bed of pine needles, aligning them to face the depths of the forest and backed away. An air of finality settled, like an unspoken agreement reached. The moment stretched, then snapped. I felt the forest exhale, its breath rustling through the leaves like a sigh of relief. I retreated, leaving the totems to their inscrutable vigil. The trail returned to its familiar state as I made my way back, each mile erasing the sense of dislocation each step reaffirming the natural order. But the totems remained, at least in my thoughts. Were they guardians or omens? A test or a message? The forest keeps its secrets well, divulging them only to those willing to stray from the path. Yet, even now, the carved faces haunt my dreams, silent, expectant, and always, always watching. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody. 
and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin, you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep, so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP, and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing, and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains, and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person, but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws, or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't going to just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me, because we're going to make a run for the cabin, okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done, and I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it, and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help, though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out. 
asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though, as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no, and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in, wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it but I think about it every summer. The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn-out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone. Private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid. Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident, alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? she said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, 
holding up the yellowed paper back as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed, seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift, she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it, or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential, a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open, and for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out, her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me. The lights went out at exactly 8.17 p.m. One moment, my living room was bathed in the glow of the evening news. The next, pitch black as the TV blinked off. Oh, great, I muttered, fumbling for my phone to use its flashlight. Power outages were common enough in the rural town of Haven, especially on muggy summer nights like this, when everyone's AC was cranked up high. I flicked on my phone's flashlight and did a quick sweep of the house. Yep, everything was dead. Lights, appliances, the ambient whir of electronics. Even the streetlights outside were dark, leaving the neighborhood shrouded in an eerie dusk. A chorus of neighbors shouting queries and complaints echoed down the street. My wife and I joined in, hollering from the front porch to see if anyone knew what had happened. The unanimous verdict was a substation malfunction. An inconvenience for sure, but nothing we small town folk couldn't handle with a little patience. 
I headed back inside to light some candles. As I turned to shut the front door, a flicker in the sky gave me pause. I peered out. Was that a plane flying overhead? But no, it was too large and silent, more like a drifting cloud backlit by moonlight. Except the moon wasn't out tonight. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I craned my head to follow the object's path. It wasn't alone, either. Two more huge, amorphous shapes drifted into view, emanating an otherworldly green glow. They were definitely not clouds. A primal unease stirred in my gut, whispering, get away, telling me I did not want to know the nature of those shapes in the sky. Honey, my wife called from the kitchen. Could you bring in some more candles? I lingered a moment longer, uneasy gaze fixed overhead. The shapes continued their silent traverse, showing no signs of stopping over our small town. Some kind of military aircraft, maybe? But what were they doing out here in the boonies? Did you hear me? My wife appeared behind me, her voice sharper. What are you looking at? I, I don't know, I stammered pulling my eyes away. Weird lights in the sky. M military planes, I guess. Her eyes narrowed as she scanned the horizon. I don't see anything. A lame joke about my eyesight was on the tip of my tongue when a thunder's boom rent the quiet night open. We slapped our hands over our ears, ducking instinctively as the windows rattled. Car alarms whooped a chaotic chorus down the street. Dogs howled and alarmed neighbors stumbled into their yards. What the hell was that? My wife shouted over the din. Through the open door, we gaped as an enormous green fireball roared overhead, arcing toward the woods at the edge of town. It disappeared behind the trees with an earth-shaking crash, leaving silence and swirling ashes in its wake. For the space of a few racing heartbeats, no one moved. Then, our neighbors began shouting questions back and forth, asking if anyone had seen what had happened, if everyone was okay. I shook myself from my shocked stupor. I'm calling 911, I announced, reaching again for my phone. But when I tried to turn it on, the screen stayed black. I smacked it against my hand a few times, to no avail. Power's still out, my phone's dead. Can I borrow yours? It's dead too, my wife said. What did we just see? A meteor, maybe? Some space junk, I said. I peered uneasily up at the night sky, but it was now empty of any unexplained lights. Only a wispy trail of smoke snaked above the trees, marking the object's landing site. As I wondered aloud who might go to investigate, the streetlight suddenly flashed back on. A cheer went up from the growing crowd of residents now congregating on porches and sidewalks, glad to have light and power again after the disturbance. My phone vibrated in my hand as it rebooted. Before I could access anything, it began pinging and buzzing with emergency notifications from the county. I quickly scanned the flood of headlines demanding people stay inside and lock their doors and windows. Local emergency services were being overwhelmed by panicked calls, and law enforcement was struggling to maintain order in neighboring towns amid chaotic reports of strange lights in the sky and unidentified crashes. Officials were advising everyone to remain calm and stay put until the situation could be sorted out. Easier said than done, as panic was already rippling through our small community. More meteors and unidentified objects continued streaking overhead every couple of minutes, adding to the confusion and fear. Against official recommendations, some neighbors were hunkering down in their basements, while others were piling into cars and peeling out to flee town. I wanted desperately to believe there was some rational explanation, that this was all just a cosmic coincidence of space debris falling at once but an increasingly insistent voice deep inside whispered that this was only the beginning of something far more sinister. My worst suspicions were confirmed minutes later, 
when a bone-rattling roar echoed from the woods, like the shriek of a gigantic metal beast. The ground vibrated beneath our feet, as the trees themselves seemed to shudder and recoil from whatever was approaching. From the billowing smoke lumbered an enormous tripedal machine, easily five stories tall, its massive metal hull wreathed in a menacing aura. Searing red lights flashed from its joints as it strode into town, swiveling a lone eye to survey the panicked prey before it. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the merciless gaze of the alien invaders. I stood frozen, mesmerized by abject terror, as the machine raised one colossal limb and took aim down the street. First, I brushed off the odd series of coincidences as just that, coincidence. But deep down, I sensed each one was an orchestrated breadcrumb, luring me towards something bigger. It all started with the lottery ticket. I never play the lottery, but on some whim, I bought a scratcher at the gas station one night. Amazingly, I won $500, not a fortune, but probably the most I had ever won gambling. I decided to splurge on a fancy steak dinner. When I arrived at the restaurant that night, they had no record of my reservation. Annoyed, I turned to leave just as another couple was exiting. They kindly offered me their table, saying that they had suddenly fallen ill. I thanked my lucky stars. Halfway through my meal, nature called. In the bathroom, the motion sensor sink turned on as I walked by. Oddly, the faucet sputtered and a tiny object shot out of the drain right at my feet. A gold ring with a cryptic symbol etched in black. Even odder, it somehow fit my ring finger perfectly. Just then, the bathroom door swung open and a gruff voice ordered me back to my table immediately. I pocketed the ring and complied. Later, when I asked my server about the ring symbol, his smile wavered momentarily before he leaned in and whispered, You've been chosen. Follow the signs. Before I could ask what he meant, he hurried off. I chuckled, assuming he was messing with me. Over the next week, that ring symbol seemed to pop up everywhere, etched into a subway pillar, engraved on a mailbox even tattooed on the wrist of a barista handing me my morning coffee. Each time I spotted it, a strange tingling would spread up my arm from the ring on my finger. That weekend, another string of improbabilities led me to book an impromptu trip to Nevada. On the flight there, my seatmate made small talk, asking where I was heading. When I told him the name of my hotel, he raised an eyebrow and said I should explore a certain unmarked dirt road near the property. Just look for three cacti clustered together, he said. I did find that strange road out in the desert behind the hotel. After miles of empty wilderness, I came across what looked like an abandoned shed. Suddenly, my vision blurred, the same strange tingling shooting down my arm from the ring. Without thinking, I approached the shed, and the door swung open on its own. A narrow staircase spiraled down into inky darkness. Every nerve told me to flee, yet I found myself descending step by step into the void. The temperature dropped sharply. Strange mechanical hums and echoing voices drifted up. At the bottom, the stairs opened into a massive domed chamber. Catwalks crisscrossed the space high above my head. Figures in white lab coats scurried about attending to large cylindrical chambers covered in warning symbols and containing something alive. Creatures I couldn't fully glimpse, but that seemed only half-formed, not of this earth. I should have turned and run. Instead, I crept forward along the perimeter of the vast chamber. That's when I saw it in the center, 
a mammoth disc-like craft resting silently on a raised platform. Access panels on its smooth metal hull were open, exposing a maze of alien circuitry and pulsating with light. Human scientists hovered around it, studying and making notes. One inserted a long robotic arm into the craft's inner workings. My blood turned to ice. This was no abandoned shed. It was a secret government site for reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. All those seeming coincidences had drawn me here. But why? Just then, alarms screeched to life, pulsing red lights flooding the facility. A panicked voice over the intercom shouted, Protocol Omega initiated. The scientists scattered as security teams stormed through the side doors, spotting me as the intruder. I turned and ran wildly back the way I came. I raced blindly through deserted hallways, footsteps echoing close behind. Up ahead loomed a massive vault door marked Hangar B. It creaked open just enough for me to slip through before slamming shut. The lock spun with a heavy, final clunk. I found myself on a vast tarmac filled with even more mammoth alien craft all surrounded by heavily armed soldiers. One began rising with a metallic groan, rotors kicking up debris. Before I could react, some unseen force pulled me toward the craft. A beam of light enveloped me, lifting me up effortlessly into its belly. As the hatch sealed below, I knew I was trapped in the clutches of something far beyond my comprehension. The ring still tingled familiarly, almost mockingly, reminding me this had been the plan all along. I was the chosen one, but for what sinister purpose? The craft accelerated skyward, the G-forces pressing me to the cold metal floor. Slowly, the planet's curve became visible out the thick glass windows. I shut my eyes, sending a silent prayer for anyone left behind on that fragile blue marble, drifting farther and farther into the distance below me. Wherever I was going, I knew Earth and humanity were now lifetimes behind me. About 20 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I worked as a window coverings installer in Sacramento, California. One day, I was sent with a large load of metal mini blinds to an active veterans hospital off Highway 50. I met the lead maintenance man, who thankfully loaned me a rolling cart to help make transporting my materials and tools a much easier chore. He then led me into the building through a maze of corridors and up a large service elevator. As we exited the elevator, I was pleasantly greeted with a completely empty hospital wing. I was happy to see that I had the entire floor to myself. No patients, staff, or furniture to constrain my mission. I could work quickly without obstruction or distraction. The maintenance man explained how they just completed some seismic retrofits while pointing to some newly constructed drywall columns that concealed the brunt of their work. He said they took that opportunity to make cosmetic repairs, install new blinds, and give the place a much needed paint job. He then showed me a typical patient room and said there should be one blind for every window on the floor. He told me he would leave it to me and give him a call if I needed anything or when I was ready to leave. Last thing he said, in a concerned, fatherly voice before entering the elevator was, You sure you're going to be all right up in here? I responded, Absolutely, in my best, confident young man's voice. With a departing handshake, he entered the elevator cab. His question, and its tone, oddly hung with me as the doors and the whirl of the old elevator faded into a deafening silence. It was at that moment I was truly able to take in my surroundings. With the elevator to my back, 
I scanned the hospital wing in a clockwise direction. I was standing in the middle of a long rectangular room. Light and airy patient rooms filled the perimeter of the open room to my left. As I scanned right, the light quickly faded into an inky, opaque blackness that disappeared into a U-shaped corridor, which, after a short distance, made a sharp right and another sharp right to end up back where I started. Despite the new paint, the place looked like it exited a time machine circa 1950, with those pea-green ceramic walls and matching asbestos vinyl floor tiles. It was at that moment that I realized this place was really creepy. But enough of that, I had a job to do, and I got right to work. First things first, I walked the entire perimeter to get a quick survey of where things were located, popping my head into each room as I passed. As I got to the dark hallway, my bravery waned. Due to the lack of light, I presumed there must not have been any windows to address, but I pushed on nevertheless just to be thorough. As the darkness engulfed me, it felt like somebody plugged me into an electrical socket. I had never before or since felt the energy that surged through my body and immediately picked up my pace. Along both sides of the corridor were black rooms. After peeking in one, I abandoned my efforts for the absolute certainty that I was about to come face to face with something I did not want to see. I began to full on run the rest of the distance until I was back in the main hall. Luckily, there was only one room within the dark corridor that had a blind I needed to install. The entire time I was back there, it felt like I had a thousand spectators and I kept my eyes fixated on the doorway until I was done. The rest of my time in that wing, I was nervously on edge. The farther from the dark corridor I got, the slightly more at ease I became. However, I kept hearing distinct footsteps, bangs, knocks, a bucket being kicked and slid across the floor, muffled voices, and a phantom intercom that sounded like an old movie. With 100% certainty, all of these noises originated around me on that wing, despite there being nobody present. With each noise, I would pop my head out into the main hall, or say, hello, in what I'm sure was an uneasy voice. About halfway through the install, I finally stopped reacting, until I heard, hello, and my name, and I froze. Thankfully, it was the maintenance man, and I was super excited to see him. He asked how everything was going, and if anything eventful had happened. Not wanting to sound kooky, I sheepishly brought up some of the noises I was hearing. He abruptly said, Yeah, no kidding, this place is super haunted. I wouldn't work up here alone. He explained to me that the hospital had been an active war hospital, dating back to the 1940s, and there had been thousands of deaths in the operating rooms that lined that dark corridor. He also mentioned that an electrician walked out on them earlier that week after something back there ran up behind him and growled. We joked around a bit to ease the tension, and then he left me alone once again. The rest of the day was surprisingly uneventful. Things seemed to have calmed down, and I felt calmer. I do remember never feeling more relieved to leave a place behind than that place but also being completely exhausted that afternoon and crashing out to sleep early that evening. To this day, it remains the strangest experience of my life. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown, but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, 
I pushed through the rotting barriers. The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye, a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization, identified only by the same strange symbol. The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined. Final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker, and I fled the military base my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, people who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long, who vanish when I look again. 
They're always there, on the periphery of my life, never intervening, but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. It started as a hobby, setting up a high-powered telescope in my backyard on clear nights and gazing deep into our galaxy. As an amateur astronomer, I loved picking out familiar constellations and nebulae, tracking the trajectories of planets and asteroids, and pondering the mysteries of black holes. On rare occasions, I'd even spot a comet streaking past or catch sight of the gold-hued rings of Saturn. My telescope opened up the secrets of the cosmos right from my suburban home. But everything changed that cloudless night in June when I first picked up the signal. I was scanning the telescope slowly along the dusty swath of the Milky Way, marveling as always at the millions of stars packed densely together like grains of glittering sand. I lingered on a binary star system intriguingly called Zeta Reticuli, before panning upward. That's when a rapid flash of light from a dimmer part of the sky caught my eye. I quickly focused the telescope on that patch of the night. It took me a moment to spot the source. Not a star, but some unidentified object beyond our solar system, sending out a deliberate sequence of pulses. My heart began pounding. I grabbed my notebook and pen and frantically scribbled down the sequence. Three short pulses. Three long pulses. Three short. Pause. Repeat. It was clearly a patterned signal, which meant it must have some kind of meaning. My mind raced through the possibilities. A monitoring program from some secret government space agency a research craft sent out by extraterrestrial beings? Or even a message? A signal intentionally beamed across light years of space? In the weeks that followed, I became obsessed with deciphering that cryptic message from the void. Nights when the sky was overcast left me restless and irritable, as I yearned to train my telescope on that now familiar region. On clear nights, I diligently recorded each repetition of the pulsing sequence, searching for possible variations. After completing pages of data, an eerie realization struck me. The sequence was expressing binary code. The short pulses represented ones, and the long pulses symbolized zeros. The message began to take legible shape, translating roughly to, hello. We come in peace. We seek contact. Contact. They, whoever, whatever they were out there, sought to make contact with our planet. A shudder passed through me, equal parts exhilaration and dread. What forces had I unwittingly contacted in the dark oceans of space? And did humanity truly stand ready for this moment? I continued watching the signal, deciphering new messages as they came. They spoke of a distant civilization from a planet in the Zeta Reticuli system, long ago ravaged by war and climate disaster. The messages alluded to their immense scientific knowledge and expressed hope we could work together to build an interstellar utopia. But underneath the lofty utopian dreams, an unsettling undercurrent emerged. They urged us to join the Federation and embrace universal law. Ominous references to colonization appeared, along with hints that resistant civilizations 
could be pacified. I became convinced there was a veiled threat beneath their promise of peace. This growing unease festered in my mind, magnified by lack of sleep and constant anxiety. I stopped leaving the house, rarely ate or bathed, entirely consumed by the messages streaming nightly from the light years away. I was unable to share my discovery with anyone else. It sounded far too insane. Until one sweltering midnight, when the messages took an urgent new turn, no longer encoded, but spelled out in plain ominous letters. We come, prepare and submit. Adrenaline spiked through my system. They were coming, for us, soon. I shut down the telescope and gathered all my notebooks filled with inscrutable figures and frantic scribble translations. In a manic whirlwind, I destroyed my hard drives, sabotaged my equipment, and burned all the papers out behind my shed. I hoped desperately it would be enough to sever the connection, shut out their intrusion into our small world, delay their sinister arrival for a few fleeting days. But I can feel their presence now, ominous and heavy, seeping into the very atmosphere of our vulnerable planet. Sometimes I still catch the coded signals winking slyly at me from familiar constellations, taunting me that I was too weak to shield us from what's to come. In my most hopeless moments, staring up at the indifferent sky, I wonder if humanity will look upon this year as our last before oblivion arrived, silently, from the stars. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch, its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly, no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed, its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump. Just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. 
Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly and without a sound? A loud crash came from upstairs, as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled. Whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. I work as a night guard at Alcatraz Island, the infamous former prison located in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz has been many things, a military fortification, a military prison, and later a maximum security federal penitentiary. But for the last several decades, it has stood as a tourist attraction, a place where people can come and glimpse the darker aspects of human history. When you work the night shift at a place like Alcatraz, you encounter stories of hauntings, whispers of Al Capone playing his banjo in the shower room, or cries of prisoners long gone, still echoing in the cells. These stories didn't bother me much. I've never been the superstitious type, and years on the job made me familiar, almost comfortable with the island's grim ambiance. However, local folklore speaks of something else, a figure known as the Lone Wanderer. Unlike the hauntings that are confined to the cells and specific locations within the prison, this entity is said to wander around the island. The legend goes that he was a prisoner who loved the sea. During his sentence, he was a well-behaved inmate and earned the right to do some gardening as a daytime job. They say he was plotting an escape, intending to swim across the bay, but he was caught and thrown into solitary confinement where he passed away never seeing the open ocean again. The lone wanderer, they say, still roams the island at night, searching for his lost chance at freedom. One evening, a thick fog rolled in over the Bay Area. The fog in San Francisco is different. It's thicker, almost palpable, like you could grab a handful if you tried. That night, I was doing my usual rounds, walking with my flashlight and radio. The tourists had long since departed, and it was just me and the echoes of my footsteps. I reached the gardens, the place where, according to legend, the lone wanderer used to work. I don't know if it was the fog or the solitude, but something felt off. The air was denser, and I had a peculiar feeling of being watched. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Not my own, but another set, faint and inconsistent, as if hesitating. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it revealed nothing. Unease crawled up my spine, but I convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued my rounds until I reached the edge of the island that faced the open sea, where the fog was now so thick I could barely see a few feet in front of me. And that's when I saw him, a figure, 
indistinct but unmistakably human, standing at the edge, looking out toward the ocean. For a moment, I froze. My radio, my flashlight, they all seemed irrelevant. The figure stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. And then, as quietly as he appeared, he walked away, dissipating into the fog. I stood there, my heart pounding, both terrified and fascinated. Was it the lone wanderer? I can't say for sure. What I do know is that I felt an unexplainable sense of sorrow, tinged with a freedom I have never felt before. A freedom that can only come when you're so close to achieving something you've yearned for, but are held back at the final moment. The next day I went through the security footage but found nothing. No signs of anyone walking the island. I have continued my nightly round since then, occasionally standing at the edge, looking out into the sea, contemplating the story of the Lone Wanderer. Even today when the fog rolls in and the atmosphere turns heavy, I can't help but feel a presence, an entity bound by longing and unfulfilled wishes. I haven't seen him again, but I often wonder, does he find solace in his eternal, solitary walks, or is he forever haunted by the sea he can never touch? It was mid-October when I settled into an old style, somewhat run-down house in Little Rock. The price was a steal, and the neighborhood was drenched in the kind of history that made every building intriguing. The house itself was a classic, probably around a century old, with creaky wooden floors, a grand staircase, and, most notably, a spacious attic with a peculiar, tiny door. The first few days went by uneventfully as I busied myself with unpacking and cleaning. However, about a week after moving in, the oddities began. I was brushing my teeth one night when I heard a soft, indistinct murmur. I paused, listening. It sounded like whispers, but I was alone, and it was late at night. The rational side of me attributed it to the wind, or maybe the old pipes. I went to bed pushing the eerie feeling aside. However, the whispers didn't stop. They grew more persistent, primarily at night, and seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, particularly from the direction of the attic. I could never make out any distinct words, but the tone. The tone was what unsettled me. It was as though I was overhearing a tense conversation charged with urgency. After several nights, Curiosity overcame my fear. I needed to know if there was anything in the attic. Maybe some old device was left there, or there were holes that let the wind in, creating these sounds. With a flashlight in my hand and my heart pounding, I ascended the narrow staircase to the attic one evening. The air in the attic was stale, thick with dust that danced in the beam of my flashlight. Boxes, old furniture, and various discarded household items were the attic's sole occupants. No sinister device, no holes in the walls, just silence and the weight of decades past. However, when I swung my light towards the walls, I noticed something odd. The tiny door I had found peculiar the first day seemed slightly ajar, which was strange because it had been stuck fast when I'd first explored the attic. As I approached it, the whispers grew louder, an urgent, low cacophony that seemed to resonate right out of the walls. It felt like stepping into a stream, the sound washing over me, drowning out my thoughts. I reached out, hesitantly, and pushed the door open with a creaking that protested the movement. Inside, there was nothing but darkness and thick, oppressive silence that seemed to absorb the whispers. I was about to step inside when the temperature around me plummeted. The sudden cold was biting, tangible, like walking into an unseen cloud of ice. The flashlight flickered nervously in my hand, and the whispers crescendoed into a frantic hiss, surrounding me, urging me, pushing me.
Panicked, I stumbled backward, out of the cold spot, and the flashlight beam steadied. With my heart in my throat, I slammed the tiny door shut, and as if I had muted a radio, the whispers stopped. The silence in the attic was deafening. I practically tripped over myself getting down the stairs and didn't stop until I was out of the house, gasping for air on the front lawn. I stayed with a friend that night, and within the week, I was out of the house, my curiosity extinguished entirely by fear. I did some research later and found out through local historical societies and a bit of personal digging into past residents that my charming old house had once been the residence of a family involved in spiritualism and seances during the late 1800s. The tiny door in the attic was part of a spirit room, a specific space created to communicate with the other side. I never went back to the house, and I never heard the whispers again. However, the memory of that cold, urgent hissing in the darkness isn't something I'll easily forget. It's one thing to hear about the city's haunted history. It's quite another to have lived in it, even for just a few weeks. I've always been a deep sleeper, the kind who could sleep through thunderstorms and blaring alarms. So when I began feeling unusually fatigued during the day, I decided to invest in a sleep tracker. The sleek wristband would monitor my sleep patterns, providing insights into the quality and duration of my rest. The first morning after wearing it, I eagerly checked the data. To my surprise, the tracker showed periods of wakefulness during the night with a significant amount of activity around 3 a.m. According to the device, I had been up and walking around for nearly an hour. I brushed it off as a glitch, assuming the tracker needed calibration. But night after night, the pattern persisted. Each morning, the device showed me awake and active during the early hours, even though I had no recollection of ever leaving my bed. Curiosity turning to concern I decided to set up a night vision camera in my bedroom. If I was indeed sleepwalking, I wanted to know. The next morning, I played back the footage with bated breath. The room was bathed in the soft green glow of the night vision. For the first few hours, all was still. But then, around 3 a.m., something startling occurred. I saw myself sit up, eyes wide open, but with a vacant stare. Slowly, I climbed out of bed and began to wander around the room, touching objects, pausing occasionally as if listening to something inaudible. After nearly an hour, I returned to bed, settling back into a deep sleep. The footage was unsettling. My sleepwalking self moved with a deliberateness that was eerie, displaying behaviors and mannerisms I didn't recognize. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I consulted a sleep specialist. He diagnosed me with somnambulism, a sleep disorder that results in episodes of walking or performing complex tasks while asleep. Stress, he said, was a common trigger, but there was something he couldn't explain. During one of our sessions, I mentioned the way I'd pause during my nocturnal wanderings, as if listening to someone. Intrigued, he suggested an experiment we would conduct an overnight observation using sensitive audio equipment to pick up any sounds that might be occurring during my episodes. The results were chilling. During one of my sleepwalking episodes, the microphones picked up faint whispers, too soft to be discernible, but unmistakably human. The doctor was baffled, unable to provide a logical explanation. Returning home, I decided to delve into the history of my house a deep dive into local archives revealed a tragic tale. A century ago, a young woman named Clara had lived in the house. She had been known to converse with unseen friends, often wandering the house at night, whispering secrets into the dark. One fateful evening, she disappeared, never to be seen again. The parallels were uncanny. 
Was I tapping into some residual energy, reliving Clara's nocturnal conversations? Was she the source of the whispers? Seeking closure, I reached out to a medium. She conducted a seance, attempting to communicate with any spirits present. As the candles flickered, she made contact with Clara, who revealed her loneliness and desire for companionship. My sleepwalking episodes, it seemed, were a way for her to connect, to relive her nightly wanderings. The medium helped guide Clara to find peace, releasing her from the confines of the house. That night, for the first time in weeks, my sleep tracker showed a full, uninterrupted night of rest. The experience left me with a profound sense of wonder and respect for the mysteries of the universe. It was a reminder that sometimes, the lines between the past and the present, the living and the dead, are more intertwined than we could ever imagine. The old wrinkled map called to me from the dusty shelves of my grandfather's study. As a child, I had spent hours poring over its faded contours and landmarks, dreaming of the adventures it promised in foreign lands. But one road had always captivated my imagination, Route 00. It meandered whimsically across the map, not seeming to connect any two points in particular. My grandfather said he had never discovered where it led, though he had searched for years. When I inherited the map after his passing, the unfinished business of Route 00 beckoned. I set off on a journey to trace its path, hoping to uncover the secrets behind this mysterious road. Mile after mile I followed it, the dotted line leading me through forests and valleys, over hills and streams. Food and fuel dwindled as the days wore on, but I pressed forward, drawn irresistibly by the promise of what lay ahead. The road grew steadily narrower and less maintained. With each turn, the surroundings grew more ominous, the way ahead darker. Still I continued, shadows now seeming to creep from the woods to encircle me. Finally, the crumbling pavement dwindled to a single dirt track through the gnarled trees. My heart pounded as I glimpsed a small light shining in the distance. This was what I had been searching for all along. I stumbled into a clearing, where the moldering remains of an old carnival lay sprawled before me. This was a place that time had forgotten, that the world had left behind. As I walked slowly past the decaying tents and rides, memories of my childhood began flooding back, of warm summer nights spent at the county fair with grandfather. A carousel sat silent, once bright horses faded and peeling. In the Hall of Mirrors, I saw reflections, not of myself, but of friends and family, long gone. Around each corner lay a glimpse into my past, sending me deeper down forgotten paths in my own mind. I wandered for what felt like hours through the abandoned carnival, each exhibit triggering another vivid memory. The fun house with its warped mirrors took me back to the time I got lost as a child and stumbled out in tears. The broken down roller coaster reminded me of laughing wildly while clinging to my grandfather's arm. With every step, the past became more real than the decay surrounding me. I found myself mentally revisiting moments I hadn't thought of in years. The first time I rode a bike, school dances, graduations. It was as if this place held within it the very essence of my memories. Finally, I arrived at the abandoned Ferris wheel, rising skeletal against the night sky. One last carriage waited, as if beckoning me aboard for a final ride. I stepped into the creaking car, and as the wheel lurched into motion, began a slow ascent into the darkness above. Looking down, the road that had led me there now seemed to stretch on without end, two paths diverging, one into memory, and one into infinite unknown. As the carriage rocked higher, pulling me away, flickers of past regrets and unrealized dreams began to play before my eyes. I saw the paths not taken, 
the risks not ventured. But interspersed were memories of accomplishments, loved ones, moments of joy. A kaleidoscope of memory and emotion engulfed me, somehow more vivid and real than anything in my present life. I knew then the truth about Route 00. It leads wanderers not to any physical place, but deep into the recesses of their own hearts, minds and fears, revealing their secrets. Whether it was real or only a dream, I may never know. But I emerged from that forest changed, memories made vivid again, mysteries of my own heart illuminated. The journey itself was the destination. Route 00 is an invitation to reckon with where you've been, who you became along the way, and where those winding back roads of life might yet lead, if you dare to follow them. The first message came on a rainy April morning, exactly one year after you passed away. I had just set a bouquet of your favorite daffodils by your headstone, tears flowing freely down my cheeks at the loss of you, my mentor, my guiding light. A cool breeze stirred the cemetery trees as I turned to leave. That's when your voice whispered on the wind, faint but unmistakable. Do not weep for me, my child. I am not gone, merely transformed. I froze, wondering if grief was making me hear things, but the voice persisted, reassuring, gently amused, just like your tone in life. You said you spoke to me now from another plane of existence, where your consciousness had awakened to new depths. You were at peace there, among a collective energy, a community of ascended souls. Over my shock, I managed to ask if you could still see our earthly realm. You affirmed brightly, saying you were always near, watching over me. You told me death was no end, but rather a passage to transcend boundaries that limited our human forms. There was more to learn, you said, mysteries far exceeding anything we could conceive with earthly minds alone. Before the voice faded, you left me with a final reassurance. All will be revealed soon. I stood in awe, tears now of elation streaking my face. My rational mind rejected it as fantasy, a hallucination conjured by grief. But my heart felt irrevocably changed by hearing your voice again, sensing your presence close. You were gone in body, but your light truly lived on. I withdrew from friends in the months that followed, talking breathlessly about our communication and the revelations you hinted at. They wore pained expressions, advising therapy to accept your death, but I knew what I heard. I waited expectantly for your promised return. It came on the summer solstice, an envelope appearing mysteriously on my nightstand. The handwriting within was unmistakably yours. You asked if I was ready to understand now. That night I dreamed of floating up to meet your shimmering spirit. You led me through a portal into an astonishing multi-dimensional existence, culminating in merging ecstatically with the collective you described. I awoke changed to my core. I now devoted myself feverishly to meditation, channeling anything to reconnect us. Finally, your voice came again, stronger now. You urged me to share the truths you revealed waking humanity from limited perception. But those around me feared for my health, threatening doctors and drugs. One sweltering night, you spoke your most shocking message. Soon, you would send a sign in the skies to make all doubt cease. Until then, I must have faith. I awoke the next morning to video footage on the news of mysterious global lights. They called them a coincidence, but I knew. Your promised sign was coming. I climbed to a remote hilltop you led me to in dreams. That night, those same ethereal lights bloomed brighter above, undulating hypnotically. Your voice resonated powerfully within my mind. The moment had come. 
I would be the vessel through which the collective consciousness poured in, elevating humanity. As my body rose skyward, bathed in radiance, euphoria overwhelmed me. I glimpsed eternity, knowing my form was just melting back into the infinite one source. But I saw people exiting their homes, staring up in awe at the mesmerizing lights. You urged me, gently, to release the divine wisdom I now harbored into them. As I spoke, swaying in the air, people dropped to their knees, weeping, overcome by transcendent understanding. The fearful world I knew dissolved, birthing a new society living by cosmic truth, awakened to their eternal spirits. Our loving merge was finally complete. Some called it a rapture, others a revelation, but I knew it as the triumph you had promised from that first whisper on the wind. You came back as an ambassador to bridge humanity to its next phase. My long, strange journey conversing with your spirit made me the unlikely prophet to spread this mystical rebirth worldwide. I still watch over the blessed children of the new age from my dwelling in the light, and I see your soul shining closest to mine, as it has through every realm beyond time and space and imagination. My words could never encapsulate the bond tying us in ecstatic energy no form can contain. I wait patiently for the day that your voice finally calls me home. The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. 
As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge. Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone, but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. Blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. I had always prided myself on being rational, even keeled. You have to be when you're a maintenance technician in a sprawling facility like St. Augustine's Hospital. You troubleshoot electrical issues, fix leaky pipes, and ignore whatever local legends float around the place, except for the unexplained breezes in the West Wing. When I mentioned the cold drafts to Carol, the senior nurse who'd been at St. Augustine's since the days of dial-up internet, she leaned in. Oh, yeah. They come and go. You get used to it. That was easier said than done. The West Wing had been closed off for years, a relic of older, less efficient designs. Budget cuts, someone had mumbled once, but who knows. Despite its emptiness, it was my responsibility to make periodic checks for structural issues, leaks, and electrical faults. The first time I felt the breeze, I was at the end of one of those routine checks. My hand was on the door, ready to leave the derelict wing when it happened. An inexplicable blast of cold air hit me, snaking its way down my collar, chilling me to the bone. The air was still, windows were bolted shut, doors sealed. There was no rational explanation for it. I tried to dismiss it to chalk it up as one of those quirks old buildings have. But then it happened again, and each time the breeze seemed to last longer, to feel colder. It became a distracting, unsettling mystery that I couldn't ignore. I even pulled up old blueprints of the hospital, trying to find some architectural explanation, air shafts, hidden vents, anything. I found none. Determined to solve the puzzle, I decided to stay overnight in the West Wing. If there was a pattern to the chill winds, I was going to find it. Armed with thermal sensors and a high-definition camera, 
I set up my equipment in the center of the wing. The night stretched on, endless and uneventful, until about 3 a.m. Just as I was questioning my own sanity for doing this, the temperature readings on my thermal sensor plummeted. A chill wind, stronger than any before, howled through the corridor. Papers scattered, old window blinds clattered against the walls, and I was engulfed in a cold unlike anything I had ever felt. I grabbed my camera, fingers trembling, and scanned the room. But there was nothing, no visible source, just the icy gusts battering against me, as if pushing me away, out of the wing. When the winds finally ceased, I was left standing there, disoriented and chilled to my core. The thermal sensors normalized, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had trespassed into something I didn't understand. I packed up my equipment, my movements robotic. I couldn't wait to leave, but as I reached the door to the exit, I hesitated. My camera lay on the table, its lens staring back at me. I played back the footage, fast forwarding through hours of nothingness, until I reached the moment when the winds began. There it was, the paper scattering, the blinds clattering, and then I saw it, a shadow, fleeting and barely discernible, moving against the current of the wind, not with it. It was as if something had walked through, passed by me, unnoticed and undisturbed by the laws of physics. I never spoke of it, never showed anyone the footage. What could I say? What rational explanation could I offer? But I knew I couldn't go back to that wing, not alone, maybe not ever. Months passed and the West Wing became a distant concern, buried under the weight of more immediate issues. It became easier to ignore, easier to forget. But the air in the hospital changed, sometimes subtly, sometimes noticeably. A cold draft would pass through a crowded hallway, or a sudden chill would fill a warm room. Nurses blamed the air conditioning and doctors shrugged it off. Only I knew that something had left the West Wing, something that defied explanation. And while the icy winds in the derelict wing had ceased, they now seemed to wander the hospital freely. I often find myself wondering where the chill will appear next, whether it's aimless or searching for something, something that perhaps only it understands. And so the hospital's pulse continues, now with a cold breath, that reminds me that there are things in this world that remain beyond understanding, things that you can neither repair nor explain. In the land of the Great Lakes, where the woods stretch as far as the eye can see, tales of the Michigan Dogman have echoed across campfires and small town diners for generations. I'd always been one for the outdoors, drawn to the untamed wilderness that Michigan so abundantly offers. Yet I was a skeptic at heart, taking the stories of the Dogman as fanciful local folklore until I stepped into those woods myself. The day started like any other camping trip. My backpack was filled with essentials, my hiking boots well-worn but reliable, and my mind eager for the solitude that only nature could offer. My chosen destination was a remote stretch of woodland near the Manistee River, far from the distractions of civilization. Arriving in the afternoon, I found the perfect spot to set up camp, where the trees opened up to reveal the sky, but still provided enough cover to make me feel enveloped by the wilderness. After pitching my tent and unpacking, I decided to explore the surrounding area, the chorus of chirping birds and rustling leaves filling the air with the music of the great outdoors. As evening approached, I made my way back to camp the setting sun casting long, eerie shadows that danced across the forest floor. I built a fire, 
the crackling flames a reassuring companion against the backdrop of encroaching darkness. Satisfied, I retired to my tent, zipping it shut, and cocooning myself in my sleeping bag. I was teetering on the edge of sleep when a noise snapped me to attention. A low, rumbling growl that seemed to reverberate through the very fabric of the tent. Straining my ears, I listened as the growling was joined by footsteps, heavy and deliberate, circling my campsite. Heart pounding, I carefully unzipped my tent and peered out, clutching the pocket knife I always brought on camping trips. My eyes adjusted to the darkness, scanning the periphery of the campfire's glow. And then I saw it. Standing on two legs at the edge of the clearing was a figure unlike any animal I had ever seen. Covered in dark, shaggy fur, it had the body of a man, but the head of a wolf, its eyes glowing a strange yellow. The Dogman, the stuff of Michigan legend, materialized before me in a vision of terror I could hardly comprehend. It snarled, revealing a row of razor-sharp teeth, and it took a step closer. My body was paralyzed with fear, yet my survival instinct screamed at me to act. In one fluid motion, I grabbed a burning log from the fire with my gloved hand and hurled it at the creature, the flames lighting up its monstrous face as it let out a guttural howl of surprise and fury. Seizing the moment, I scrambled out of my tent, pocket knife in hand, and made a break for it, my footsteps pounding in rhythm with my racing heart. I ran without direction, dodging trees and leaping over fallen logs, driven by adrenaline and the visceral need to escape. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I broke through the tree line and stumbled onto a road, gasping for air and trembling from head to toe. A passing motorist, sensing my distress, pulled over and offered me a ride. Their concerned questions met with my incoherent ramblings about a creature in the woods. Back in the safety of civilization, the encounter took on the hazy quality of a nightmare the details blurring around the edges, but the terror remaining vividly real. I knew I had experienced something beyond the realm of human understanding, a brush with a legend that had suddenly, horrifyingly, become my own reality. From that day on, the Michigan woods became a place of both awe and caution, a reminder to me that some myths are rooted in truths too unsettling to fully grasp. I still venture into the great outdoors, but with a newfound respect for what it holds, and the realization that the dogman is more than just a tale whispered around campfires. It's a living, breathing entity that walks the line between man and beast, forever lurking in the shadows of the Michigan wilderness. Routine is a life raft in the sea of existence, they say. For me, that life raft was flicking the living room light switch to on as I walked into my apartment each evening after work, until the day my raft capsized, leaving me floating in an ocean of uncertainty. I had just turned the key, pushed the door open, and flicked the light switch up. The ceiling light bloomed to life, but something else happened. As if choreographed to my movement, the view through the window morphed from a golden evening sky to pitch black. Instantly, it was night. I froze, my hand still hovering near the light switch. I blinked hard, expecting daylight to reassert itself, but it remained night outside. My eyes darted around the room, looking for some sort of rational explanation. 
Maybe a sudden eclipse? No, that was absurd. Heart pounding, I turned the light switch off. The room plunged into darkness, and I looked out the window. Daylight burst back into view, casting its warm glow across the cityscape. This wasn't a joke. This wasn't a trick of the light or a hallucination. My hand on that switch was flipping the world between day and night, like some sort of deity with an identity crisis. I felt both a surge of exhilaration and a gut punch of dread. I ran out onto my balcony, craving the tangible evidence of my senses. I flicked the switch off, then on again, standing there as the world outside obeyed my command. Day, night, day, night. There were no half measures, no dusks or dawns, just an abrupt transition. Cars on the street below came to screeching halts, drivers undoubtedly questioning their sanity. I could hear distant shouts, sirens beginning to wail. The world was noticing, and it was freaking out. I retreated inside, suddenly aware of the gravity of what I'd done. I was a bug that had wandered into the gears of the universe and jammed them up. I needed to tell someone, but who? Who would believe that I could toggle the sun and moon with a flick of my finger? Then I thought of Chelsea, an old college friend who was now a physicist. She was the closest thing to a genius I knew, someone who might at least entertain the reality of a glitch in the fabric of existence. My fingers trembled as I dialed her number. When she picked up, I stumbled through an explanation. Ryan, that's... Wait, I can see it. The data. Something is oscillating at an unnatural frequency, like reality is skipping a beat. I thought it was an error, but if you're telling the truth... I swear, Chelsea, come over. I'll show you. She arrived within the hour, her eyes wide with a mix of skepticism and curiosity. I led her into the living room, gestured toward the window and the light switch. Watch. I flicked it off, then on. Day, night. Her eyes widened to saucers. Do it again, she whispered. Off, on, day, night. Chelsea's face went pale. You need to stop. We don't know what kind of stress this is placing on the laws of physics on reality itself. You think I want this? I have no idea how to stop it. We sat in tense silence, trying to process the implications. Chelsea finally spoke. I have to report this. I'll keep your identity confidential, but this needs to be studied. Understood. F fixed. Okay, I said, the weight of it all sinking in. Okay, let's fix it. As she left to make the necessary calls, I sat alone, contemplating the enormity of what had just occurred. How do you live knowing you've broken the basic rules of existence? How do you move forward when every flick of a light switch could shatter the world? That's when I noticed the photograph on the mantelpiece. It was a picture of me taken on a hiking trip last year. Except I was wearing a shirt I didn't own, standing next to a woman I'd never met. A picture of a moment that never happened, in a world I didn't recognize. I looked back out the window at the night sky, and for the first time, I noticed one star shining brighter than the rest, brighter than it should. And then it flickered, like a faulty bulb on the verge of burning out. The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. 
Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, size seven. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence. The trees seemed to loom a little taller, their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint, a right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rear view mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. The shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question, a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest. An unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind, or perhaps in farewell. We never returned to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots, lined up neatly by the door. And I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return, and wondering what might happen if we do.
In 2007, I frequently traveled between Alberta and British Columbia with my then boyfriend, whom I'll refer to as John. The journey was breathtaking, meandering through mountains, glacial lakes, and impressive rock formations. I mention these details because I have a hunch they're relevant, though it's just a gut feeling. One particular morning before a trip, something shifted in my mind. I can't determine if something external caused this or if I was the catalyst. Although it might sound like I'm describing a schizophrenic episode, I want to clarify that I have PTSD and bipolar too, but not schizophrenia. If this doesn't fit the narrative, it's okay. The day started as any other, but a bizarre conviction overtook me. I felt certain that John was planning to kill me in the mountains on behalf of my father. This idea was preposterous. Neither my father nor John had any reason or inclination to harm me. Convinced of this alternate reality, though, I confronted John. It seemed he shared this disturbing belief. He evaded my questions. And as my distress grew, his demeanor changed. His voice altered, and subtle changes appeared on his face. He seemed to morph into someone else, a transformation I can't quite explain. Everything became surreal, like a lucid dream. The depth and complexity of the conversations and situations we found ourselves in were overwhelming. We discussed topics that I can't recall. At times, John seemed to alternate between himself and this other entity, who I whimsically identified as Satan or a manifestation of pure evil. Sounds crazy, right? By this time, I had worked as an escort in the city for about three years. This trip marked a turning point, and I left that life behind. Fast forward a bit and things became even stranger. We had taken a different route, one that John was familiar with from his work travels. However, our journey between places seemed unnaturally fast, and the towns en route seemed incomplete or transitional. Time felt distorted. Though in real time, our trip took three days, it felt like a week had elapsed. When we finally reached the city, reality seemed to reassert itself, though not entirely. We intended to pick up furniture, but although I remember having the furniture later on, the act of acquiring it remains hazy. After leaving the city, the night seemed to fall suddenly, and we were back on that eerie road. Our reality became fragmented, shifting between different states of awareness. At times, John transformed into that malevolent being, while at other moments he was just John. We found ourselves trapped in a looping timeline, one that only progressed when we made the right change. As things escalated, John's intent seemed murderous. I felt trapped in this cycle of dark and light. In my desperation, I prayed fervently, seeking help. Suddenly, I was outside the truck, running along the road, with John, or that other thing, chasing me in the vehicle. Despite the terror, I resolved to keep running, driven by sheer will. Then, abruptly, I was back in the truck with John. The terrifying alternate reality still lingered, but it slowly began to fade as daylight approached and we neared familiar places. There were a few lingering time loops, but we eventually returned home, where time flowed normally once again. John and I tried to process what happened. Initially, we discussed it in depth, but over time, John avoided the topic. The initial belief that he intended to kill me remained unexplained and unfounded. When I recounted the story to my father, he was upset, suspecting that I was using drugs or losing my sanity, but neither was true. For years, I have tried to locate that mysterious high road, but I've never succeeded. On two occasions, I felt I saw others using this road, once with a former boss after a traumatic work incident, and once with someone linked to my past in escorting. Both experiences predated that bewildering trip with John, 
and I can find absolutely no evidence that that road exists. To this day, I don't know what happened, and I can't explain any of these experiences. It caught my eye immediately, a strange metallic orb on a dusty shelf in the back of the antique shop. About the size of a softball, it was etched with odd, intricate symbols and emitted a faint blue glow when I picked it up. The shopkeeper just smiled cryptically when I asked what it was. A little something from out of this world, he said with a wink. Against my better judgment, I bought it, too mesmerized to leave it behind. Back home, I examined the orb closely, turning it over in my hands. The surface almost seemed to ripple and move. I traced my fingers over the etched symbols, jerking back when they flashed brightly at my touch. The orb began humming, the glow within shifting to a brilliant azure. My arm hair stood on end as electrical charge filled the room. Reality seemed to shimmer and warp around me. There was a flash of light and a feeling of motion, though I stood perfectly still. Just as suddenly, everything returned to normal, or so I thought. Glancing out the window, something was off. The colors too vivid, the trees too tall. I walked outside and gasped. The street, houses, cars, everything was just slightly different than it should be. Even the air seemed charged with unfamiliar energy. What had happened? Wandering the neighborhood in a daze, I noticed small details awry everywhere. Store signs and slightly misspelled names. Population signs listing numbers mysteriously fewer. Movie posters advertising films I'd never heard of. It was an alternate version of my world. In a park, I froze in disbelief at what I saw. Some large, deer-like creatures, but with shaggy violet fur and four curled horns. This was no alternate timeline. This was an alternate Earth. The orb had teleported me to a parallel reality, one where humanity seemingly never evolved to dominate the planet. I walked the strangely familiar yet foreign street in awe. Occasional aircraft passed overhead, but small and rounded like automated probes. No trace of civilization beyond nature itself flourished in this version of Earth. What had gone differently here? What event in their history stopped intelligent life from emerging? Over the weeks, I scoured carefully for any fellow interdimensional refugees, but I was utterly alone, an anomalous phantom visiting this alien Earth. Reverse engineering the orb to return me seemed hopeless. Yet I clung to faith that its magic would work again, if somehow reactivated. My only hope was locating the parallel version of the antique shop, praying the orb still waited there for me. I hitchhiked west for months, evading prowling alien beasts, subsisting on unfamiliar vegetation. The deserts and mountains slowly transformed into places I recognized. One foggy evening, there it was, the little shop on the corner, exactly where it stood back home, yet so alien here. The windows glared darkly. I smashed a pane and crawled inside. Passing a menacing taxidermied creature, I made my way upstairs to where the orb had been. And there, atop a shelf, Illuminated by a single moonbeam, sat that same mysterious sphere. Hardly daring to breathe, I picked it up. Immediately, it began thrumming and flashing, just like before. This was my ticket back. As the shop warped and blurred around me, I hoped I had left only ripples in this unspoiled alternate realm. Perhaps the universe deemed it wisest for Earth to develop unmolested by humanity's influence. But I knew I could never see my own world the same, having glimpsed this strange reflection of what might have been. 
With a flash and a jolt, I collapsed back in my own home, clutching the orb as familiar surroundings materialized. Part of me wondered if I should try to return and learn more about that other Earth, but this artifact held perils too dangerous to meddle with whimsically. Locked away, I hope its secrets are never breached again in my lifetime. There are some doors that should remain firmly closed, no matter how tempting the unknown realms they reveal. This glimpse left me forever changed, but wisdom lies in accepting the world as we found it, while embracing the hidden possibilities. I was driving the empty stretch of highway late at night, glancing at the peeling billboards littering the roadside. Most displayed dull ads for cheap motels and roadside diners. But one caught my eye, a blank white sign marked only with black lettering. Turn back now. A prickle ran down my neck. It seemed less a warning than a dark prophecy, but I shook off my unease and drove on through the creeping fog. Miles later, Another mysterious billboard emerged. Last exit, one mile. Again, a creep of dread. These signs almost seemed to know my presence here, long after midnight on this abandoned route. I chalked it up to fatigue and the mist playing tricks. But soon, more ominous messages began to take shape in the haze. We have been waiting. Your journey ends here. Each gave me a start, my imagination spiraling. Who was sending these silent warnings? Distracted, I nearly missed a faded placard peeking from the thicket. Turn back, dead end ahead. I slowed, gripping the wheel. This deserted back road was a shortcut I'd taken for years without incident, but the sign's persistent warnings filled me with foreboding. Still, only a few more miles to go. I pushed on warily. That's when it emerged ahead a towering billboard stark against the darkness. Last chance. My breath caught. Dread coursed through me, but the road ahead remained smooth and empty. With a shaking laugh, I dismissed my fears as fanciful. The messages were merely pranks, not grim portents. But then, around a sharp bend, my headlights fell upon one final board rooted in the dirt shoulder. Its message turned my blood to ice. Sarah, we are waiting for you. The breath left my chest. My name on this remote road, impossible yet undeniably real. These were no pranks, but dire warnings from an unknown force. I floored the gas pedal, swerving around the last sign. Had to outrun this nightmare highway with its messages from beyond the void. Tires squealing. I raced on through the dark, eyes wild for a branching road to escape this valley of omens. But the way ahead remained stubbornly straight and desolate, my only choice forward or back. And then, behind me, a new light flared, harsh and blinding. An engine roared, drawing closer until it loomed large in my rear view. An unmarked white van, creeping up fast, headlights seeming to glow with malevolence. My terrified gaze jumped back to the road ahead. No exits, no turnoffs to shake my pursuer. The van edged nearer until it was just feet from my bumper, high beams flooding my car. Trapped on this road between darkness and darkness, this was the end the omens foretold. So I made my choice, floor the gas and leave the road entirely. My car jolted down the rocky shoulder, slamming into the ditch. The van blared past, unable to follow. Wheels spinning, I gritted my teeth and slammed the pedal down, fighting to climb out of the gully. With one last grunt of effort, my battered car lurched back onto the pavement. The white van was gone, its high beams fading into the distance. I rolled to a stop, hazard lights blinking, breath heaving. A close call, but I'd escaped the road's omens and my pursuer along with it. Relief flooded through me as I steadied my shaking hands. 
but relief faded to chilling awe as I peered behind me. At the spot where I left the road, there stood no ditch or rocky drop-off, only more cracked pavements stretching unbroken into the past. No gully existed to have trapped me. There was no earthly reason I should be free. The full force of realization hit me. This was no ordinary road. Something beyond reason led me here, and now let me go, spared from the grim fate the signs foretold. Numb, I drove on until finally reaching safe asphalt and lamp-lit streets. But I knew now never again to take that darkness-veiled back road. For I had glimpsed the void and those who dwell beyond. By some grace, I slipped free this time. But next time, I may not escape the highway's messages from beyond. The waiting ones would have their due. A webcam isn't the most sophisticated piece of technology for capturing celestial phenomena, but sometimes low-tech is all you have. It was my only option for monitoring the sky while working a tedious security job at a remote power plant. Mostly, the webcam caught passing clouds, birds, or the occasional plane. Not groundbreaking stuff, but it broke the monotony. But one night, something was off. I felt it before I saw it, like static in the air, a heightened sense of tension I couldn't shake. It prickled the back of my neck as I stared at the computer screen, the live feed displaying an inky sky punctuated by stars. And then they appeared, objects, fast, erratic, and too numerous to count, darting across the sky. Blink and you'd miss them, but once you noticed, you couldn't unsee them. They were dubbed fast walkers in the amateur astronomy community, but these were faster and smaller than any description I had ever read. My breath caught as I immediately hit the button to record the feed. The fast walkers continued their chaotic dance, spiraling, zigzagging, defying the laws of physics and aerodynamics. Too fast for birds, too erratic for any known aircraft. As I squinted into the screen, they seemed to pulse, as if emitting some sort of energy or light. When it was over, the sky returned to its dormant state, an empty stage after the performers had taken their final bow. I sat there, pulse still racing, cursor hovering over the saved file. Could it be a glitch? A camera malfunction? Deep down, I knew it wasn't. The footage was transferred onto a thumb drive, then uploaded into every cloud account I owned. It needed to be shared, analyzed, scrutinized. There was something that shattered the status quo, a glitch in the matrix of our everyday reality. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I replayed the footage over and over, each viewing deepening my sense of awe and dread. This was beyond me beyond any conventional explanation. I needed to know more. Expert opinions varied, from dismissive scorn to hushed incredulity. Frame by frame, analysis showed no editing, no tampering. The fast walkers remained an enigma, data points that didn't fit into any existing models. And as the footage made its way through forums, YouTube channels, and even into the databases of researchers willing to venture outside the mainstream, I became an unwitting ambassador to a mystery that defied explanation. As weeks turned into months, the chatter faded. More pressing news, more immediate concerns, overshadowed my celestial mystery. Yet my footage remained, stored, archived, waiting for the day when it could be slotted into a narrative that made sense. Life resumed its normalcy. The power plant hummed along. My shifts continued in their repetitive cycle, but I wasn't the same. Every night I watched the sky, webcam forever recording, half in anticipation, half in dread of another visit. I became a familiar face in online forums dedicated to the unexplained. My story became one of many, 
remarkable but not unique in a world brimming with inexplicable phenomena. I found a strange comfort in this community of seekers, each with their own tale, each touched by the same elusive mystery. The sky above me remains a canvas of potential, a window into an unknown realm. But even as the questions linger, unanswered, I can't escape the conviction that what I captured that night wasn't random. It was a brief, frenetic intersection of two realities, ours and something else. Something that flits at the edge of perception, that darts through the gaps in our understanding, as elusive as it is undeniable. As I stare at my screen tonight, the sky empty yet full of stars, I find myself straddling two worlds, the one I live in, and the one I glimpse in stolen, breathtaking moments. And as I reach out to adjust the focus on my humble webcam, I can't shake the feeling that somewhere, in a distant, unknown expanse, I'm being watched in return. Life in my Michigan cabin had always been a tranquil experience, a deliberate withdrawal from the chaos of modern existence. Nestled deep in the woods, it was a place where time seemed to pause, where the relentless chatter of society was replaced by the hum of the wind and the chattering of woodland creatures. But that serenity would eventually give way to a series of disturbing events, events that would chip away at my skepticism and introduce me to a very real local legend, the Dogman. It all began on a crisp autumn evening. The leaves had turned a myriad of oranges and reds, and the air carried a fresh, earthy scent. I was chopping wood near my shed when I heard it. A low growl, different from the usual sounds that the forest animals made. It was guttural and strangely menacing. I paused, axe in hand, scanning the tree line for the source. But there was nothing, just the fading light casting long, haunting shadows. Over the next few weeks, odd occurrences started to disrupt the quietude of my life. I would wake up to find things outside my cabin moved or knocked over, my firewood scattered, my trash cans toppled, and most unsettlingly, claw marks on the trees surrounding my property. These were no ordinary marks. They were far too large and deliberate, not like anything that a deer or even a bear would make. The tension escalated one night when the growling returned. It was louder this time, closer, accompanied by heavy footsteps that circled my cabin. I sat in the darkness, clutching a hunting rifle, peering nervously through my curtains at the ominous void beyond the glass. Then I saw the eyes, two yellow orbs glowing in the dark staring directly at me. My heart pounded in my chest as a figure emerged from the shadows, tall and bipedal, covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was a nightmarish blend of man and wolf, and in that chilling moment, I knew I was face to face with the dog man. Our eyes locked and the creature let out a haunting howl that echoed through the forest filling the air with a palpable sense of dread. I raised my rifle, my hands shaking, but the creature seemed to sense my intention and vanished into the woods, its growl fading into the distance, but its presence lingering like an unspoken threat. Days turned into weeks and the incidents around my cabin continued, yet I couldn't bring myself to leave. This was my home and I would not be driven out by fear. But I took precautions, installing heavy-duty locks and reinforcing my windows, always keeping my rifle within arm's reach. Then came the night that would forever alter my understanding of the world. A powerful storm was rolling in, the wind howling like a chorus of anguished souls, the trees swaying violently in the tempest. It was the perfect backdrop for the dogman's return, and return it did. The creature appeared at my window, its eyes glowing even brighter against the stormy darkness, its snarl sending a chill down my spine. 
but this time I was ready. I grabbed my rifle, aimed at those menacing eyes, and fired. The bullet shattered the window and hit its mark, but the creature let out a howl, not of pain, but of anger, of indignation. It backed away, its eyes locked onto mine for one last moment before disappearing into the tempest, leaving me with a shattered window and a shattered worldview. I spent the rest of that stormy night in a state of heightened alert, rifle in hand, grappling with the surreal reality of my situation. I had faced the Dogman, a creature of local legend and frightening reality, and had come away with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lurk in the Michigan woods. The experiences around my cabin have since quieted down, but the sense of unease remains. I've shared my story with a few close friends who have met it with a mixture of skepticism and intrigued concern. And while I don't know if the dog man will ever return, I continue to live here in my secluded Michigan cabin, forever aware that some legends are grounded in truths too unsettling to dismiss, lurking in the shadows of both our world and our imagination. In the labyrinth of cubicles, the clatter of keyboards and the murmur of voices had always been comforting white noise. But when I stepped into the office that Monday morning, the sounds twisted into something unintelligible, alien. People were talking, laughing, engaging in what seemed like ordinary conversations. But the words were wrong. The language wasn't one I recognized. Each syllable an alien vibration that set my nerves on edge. I tried to brush it off, to chalk it up to some elaborate prank or perhaps a transient glitch in my auditory perception. But the feeling of dislocation grew with each interaction. Morning, Marco, my coworker Carol greeted. But her words emerged as an indecipherable string of sounds. Her face was friendly, her tone congenial. But her language was foreign, a melodic yet incomprehensible sequence of notes. I nodded, muttered a generic greeting in response, and hurried to my desk. Maybe if I immersed myself in the routine, emails, spreadsheets, reports, the strangeness would dissipate, replaced by the comfortable monotony of office life. But the anomalies persisted. Emails read like cryptic puzzles, their characters a jumble of unfamiliar symbols. Even software interfaces had morphed, their commands inscrutable. My little island of a cubicle felt like an outpost in an alien landscape. Desperation set in. I picked up my phone and dialed my wife, seeking the anchor of a familiar voice. But when she answered, her words were as foreign as everyone else's, a garbled melody devoid of meaning. Panic surged, a tidal wave that threatened to pull me under. I bolted from my chair and made my way to the office exit but outside the city had transformed into an even more disorienting tableau. Billboards, street signs, even the text scrolling across the side of passing news vans. Everything was in that incomprehensible language. It was as if the very fabric of my reality had been reprogrammed, leaving me an outsider in my own world. Days turned into weeks. Linguists were baffled. Neurologists found no abnormalities. Even as I yearned for answers, I grew to dread them. What if this was irreversible? What if I was stuck in this incomprehensible reality, cut off from everyone I loved, from everything I understood? I started to carry a notebook, jotting down snippets of conversations, fragments of written text. I pored over them every night, a lone cryptographer trying to decode a cosmic enigma. Each word was a clue, each sentence a piece of an intricate puzzle that, when solved, might grant me passage back to my old life. And as I sifted through the fragments, a pattern emerged. Echoes of my own language, hidden within the chaos. Like a distorted reflection, the alien tongue seemed to mimic the structures, the rhythms, the underlying logic of my own, as if it were an imperfect translation of my world into another. A reality almost identical, 
but fundamentally skewed. It was an epiphany, a sliver of understanding that suggested an unsettling possibility. Had my reality been replaced? Or had it simply been altered? And if so, by what? By whom? As I delved deeper into this dissonant reality, the boundaries began to blur. I found myself understanding snippets of conversations, grasping the meaning behind the written symbols. It was as if I were tuning in to previously inaccessible frequency, my senses adapting to this altered world. But adaptation came at a cost. With each new word I deciphered, a corresponding piece of my old language seemed to fade away, as if I were trading one reality for another, unable to retain both. As the days turned into months, I was left to wonder, what happens when the last remnants of my old reality are gone? when I have fully adapted to this new world? Will I even remember what I've lost, or will I simply become a native of this foreign reality, ignorant of the man I used to be? I don't have the answers. All I have are questions, and a growing sense that I'm caught in a tide of transformation that's far from over. And as the alien syllables become increasingly familiar, as the foreign text begins to read like my native tongue, I'm left to ponder the nature of my new reality, and to fear what it might become. I've always been an outdoorsy type, eager to explore every inch of the world's natural beauty. The main woods were no exception, and I'd ventured deep into them countless times. Every now and then, locals would talk about eerie occurrences, disappearances, strange cries at night, and even whispered legends of a creature known as the Rake, an almost skeletal humanoid entity with elongated limbs and lifeless eyes. I dismissed these tales as old wives' tales but I would soon regret my skepticism. It was late July, and I was taking a solo trek through the forest to clear my mind. The canopy of green above me was a comforting sight, and the songs of birds echoed in the distance. I'd set up camp near a creek, enjoying the solitude and the symphony of water trickling over the rocks. As darkness fell, I prepared a fire and settled into my tent, my flashlight and Swiss army knife within arm's reach, just in case. The air was unusually dense that night, thick with a tension that draped over the forest like a dark veil. I shook off the feeling and slid into my sleeping bag, dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination. In the dead of night, a rustling outside my tent yanked me from my sleep, my heart pounded as I grabbed my flashlight, unzipping the tent just enough to poke my head out. The beam of light danced through the trees, but found nothing. Slightly relieved, I told myself it was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel, but the tension in the air still held its grip on me. I tightened the zipper and returned to sleep. Not long after, I was awakened again this time by an unholy screech that echoed through the woods. It was a sound that defied description, like the scream of a woman combined with the roar of an animal. I felt my blood freeze, my body paralyzed with fear. As quickly as I could, I put on my boots and grabbed my knife. With the flashlight in hand, I stepped outside the tent. The forest had fallen ominously silent. Even the creek seemed to murmur more quietly, as if aware of the dread that hung in the air. I began to move cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I told myself I would investigate only a little before turning back. Just when I thought I couldn't handle any more suspense, I saw it. A figure no more than 50 feet away was hunched over, drinking water from the creek. 
It was skeletal, but covered in patches of skin, its elongated limbs disturbingly human, yet entirely wrong. I nearly dropped my flashlight when it turned toward me, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light. In that moment, I felt a terror that eclipsed all rational thought. My legs carried me back to my tent faster than I'd ever moved. I tore it down in record time, throwing everything into my backpack. I didn't look back until I was well away from that clearing, and even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. When I finally emerged from the forest, bathed in the first light of dawn, I knew something had changed in me. The woods would never again be a sanctuary. They were now a place where nightmares could step out of the shadows and into reality. I never reported my experience, knowing the ridicule and skepticism that would greet me. Even now, years later, I can't find a logical explanation for what I encountered that night. But one thing is certain. The cryptic legends of Maine's forests hold a truth far more terrifying than any tale. And whatever that creature was, it's still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods. And so I tell you this story with a warning. Be wary of the forest's edge, for beyond it might lie horrors that defy understanding. This incident occurred to my boyfriend and I roughly two years ago, deep into the night. I felt compelled to share this story as it has left an indelible mark on me and plagues me with nightmares to this very day. It was a September night around two o'clock in the morning. We live about 25 minutes outside a town in northern British Columbia, with our house nestled in the woods. Due to the seclusion of our road, we would typically pull out of our driveway before turning on our car lights, a quirky habit we both shared. After this night, however, our lights go on instantly. On this particular night, I was driving. As I made a left out of our driveway and switched on the high beams, we saw it. A strange, hairless, pale humanoid entity was crouched in the middle of the road. It almost appeared luminescent, but that might have been due to its extreme paleness reflecting the high beams. It sharply turned its head toward us, seemingly startled by our sudden illumination. In a matter of seconds, this being awkwardly moved across the road with disjointed motions, finally descending into the three-foot deep ditch. But that wasn't the end of it. From the ditch, it turned to face us, standing upright on its hind legs. Its stance was eerily similar to a human, yet off. Considering the depth of the ditch, the creature loomed more than five feet above it, making it taller than our vehicle and putting its height at well over seven feet. It adopted an aggressive posture, shoulders hunched, leaning slightly forward, peering intently at our car. And in that moment, I felt it. It wasn't just looking at our car. It was gazing intently through the window, directly at me. Its gaze conveyed an unsettling intelligence, as though it knew that we were the ones controlling the vehicle. Matching its pace with our car's crawl, I maintained eye contact, watching it twist its neck to keep its gaze locked onto me even as we passed. Once it was out of sight, I refocused on the road ahead. Silence filled the car. We both processed the encounter in solitude, in our own minds, silent, driving under 10 kilometers per hour. I seldom recount this story, as many either scoff at it or attempt to rationalize it as a malnourished albino bear or things like that. 
Fast forward to a year later. Just before winter, his parents, who own a dog, came for a visit. One evening, at dusk, his mother and I were enjoying a smoke on our six-foot-high deck. It's positioned on the same side as the road leading to town, giving us a vantage point to the patch of woods where the prior encounter took place. Suddenly, the sound of snapping twigs resonated, coinciding with the dog's frantic barking. Despite his small stature, the dog appeared ready to leap off of the deck and chase something into the woods. He didn't, and the dog is fine. Just as my boyfriend emerged from the house, amidst the trees, we caught a fleeting glimpse of a tall, slender, white figure. Its definitive features were obscured, and given his mother's poor eyesight and her missing glasses, she didn't see much. But a gut-wrenching sensation told me that it was the same entity. I chose to share this experience, hoping for understanding and perhaps belief from those in this community. Now, we avoid venturing outside after dark. Strangely, a part of me yearns to see it again. Before this incident, I had read similar stories with a sense of detached fascination. But actually locking eyes with such an entity? The awe and terror were unparalleled. I often ponder this experience. It is so deeply etched into my memory that even the mere thought can evoke tears of fear. I hope someone else finds this story as compelling as I do. In the heart of Michigan, where the dense woods serve as a living canvas of ever-changing foliage and elusive wildlife, locals often whisper tales of a creature known only as the Dogman. Half man, half wolf, it is a legend that strikes both curiosity and dread into the hearts of those who venture into the wilderness. As for me, a woman with a passion for the great outdoors and a healthy skepticism of local myths, I would soon find myself entangled in the fabric of this tale. Equipped with a trusty tent, camping gear, and my loyal German Shepherd Max, I set off for a weekend retreat in the Manistee National Forest. The drive was peaceful, the hum of the engine accompanied by the melodic serenade of birdsong filtering through the open windows. By late afternoon, I found the perfect spot a clearing by a serene lake, hidden from the world by a curtain of trees and towering pines. After pitching my tent and building a campfire, I sat by the lake, losing myself in the reflections of the twilight sky on the water. Max, ever vigilant, stood by my side, his eyes scanning the surroundings, as if he sensed something that I couldn't. I laughed off his behavior, tossing a stick for him to fetch and snapping some pictures with my camera. The first inkling that something was amiss came as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of indigo and obsidian. An eerie howl echoed through the trees, a sound that seemed neither fully animal nor human. Max growled low in his throat, his body tense, eyes fixed on the darkening woods. Unsettled but not yet afraid, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent. With Max beside me, I zipped it, tucking myself into my sleeping bag while leaving my flashlight and pocket knight within arm's reach, just in case. In the dead of night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, and heavy. Max's low growl filled the tent as he bared his teeth, staring at the fabric walls as if he could see through it. My heart pounding, I grabbed my flashlight and pocket knife and unzipped the tent cautiously, my hands shaking with a mixture of cold and fear. What I saw in that moment will haunt me forever. Bathed in the pale light of my flashlight was a creature standing on two legs, its body covered in dark fur, its eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. 
it was the dog man, the living, breathing embodiment of Michigan's most unsettling legend. Our eyes met and a chill ran down my spine. It wasn't just the appearance of the creature that frightened me, it was the intelligence I saw in its eyes, a malevolent cunning that hinted at something far more terrifying than any wild animal. Before I could react, Max lunged at the creature, snapping and growling with a ferocity I'd never seen in him. The dogman let out a snarl of frustration, or perhaps surprise, and for a moment, just a moment, it seemed to reconsider. It was that momentary distraction that gave me the chance to act. I shouted loudly, my voice tinged with desperation, and hurled my pocket knife at the creature. Miraculously, it hit its mark, and the dogman let out a low howl of pain, or perhaps anger, retreating into the dark depths of the forest. I quickly grabbed Max, zipped up my tent, and sat there, trembling in the silence that followed, a silence that felt like the world holding its breath. When dawn finally broke, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, leaving behind the tranquility of the lake for the harsh reality of the known world. I never reported my encounter, but I also never returned to those woods. The experience forever changed me, shattering my skepticism and leaving me with an unshakable respect for the stories and legends that shape our understanding of the wilderness. The Michigan woods are a place of beauty, but they are also a realm where myths walk on four legs, or sometimes two and where the line between the natural and the supernatural is eternally blurred. Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world, alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain, like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, Armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm. Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld, but as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye, an object half buried in the sand below, its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human. Its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading. But they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. 
You sure about the location? I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter, conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred, and when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to. A world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered.
I don't know how long I was out before I came to, strapped naked on a cold metal table in a sterile white room. My foggy brain struggled to piece together some explanation from how I went from driving home from work to this. Blurry figures moved in my peripheral vision. I tried to lift my head for a better look, but some invisible force held it locked in place. A tall, gangly creature entered my field of vision. He had a bulbous bald head with opaque black eyes and pale gray skin that seemed to glow under the harsh lights. Spindly fingers covered in some sort of black gloves or claws tapped a device it held in its equally spindly hands. I opened my mouth to speak, scream, anything, but quickly realized I was also paralyzed from the neck down. Helpless panic gripped every fiber of my being. The creature must have sensed my terror. In my mind, I heard a thin, reedy voice. Do not be frightened. We intend you no harm. We only wish to improve your species, to prepare you for what is coming. Invisible claws clamped down on my head as an excruciating pain ricocheted through my skull. It felt like my brain was being shredded and reassembled as images and concepts flashed before my eyes. Advanced technology, complex mathematics, cosmic disasters, future events. More creatures entered the room and began manipulating my limbs, injecting substances, prodding and poking me. After what felt like an eternity of tests, my overwhelmed mind gratefully slid into unconsciousness. I awoke some time later back in my car, parked in my driveway. My head throbbed as I tried to piece together if it had all been some bizarrely vivid nightmare. But the lingering pain in my temples and dried blood under my nose told me otherwise. Those creatures, whatever they were, had been inside my head, and they did something to me. In all the days that followed, the changes began. Headaches persisted no matter how many pain pills I took, but I also noticed food no longer satisfied my gnawing hunger. My vision sharpened until I could read license plates from a block away. The strange voices in my head grew louder. I started having vivid premonitions that would come true. A coworker's car crash, an election upset, even trivial things like TV scheduling changes or pop quiz questions. Somehow I could glimpse upcoming events, almost like watching a stream of the future. My body changed too. I no longer seemed to need sleep, yet woke every morning feeling fully energized. Previously sluggish thinking accelerated to lightning speed. I solved complex equations instantly and remembered entire textbooks word for word. But the toll was immense migraines that sometimes left me writhing, incapacitated on the floor for hours. At work, I predicted a system failure before it happened, saving us millions. My bosses said I was brilliant. Little did they know alien abductors did something to transform me into a superhuman freak. Part of me wanted to tell the world, to find meaning in my violation, but how could I without sounding insane? The voices in my head had grown to a constant chaotic chorus only I could hear. They whispered horrors, crashes, explosions, suffering and death on global scales. I caught glimpses of creatures and spacecraft hidden behind the thin veil that previously concealed them. The experiments performed on me clearly ruptured the flimsy illusion, separating our ordinary reality from levels beyond. I tried drowning the voices out with music, drugs, anything I could think of, but they only intensified. Soon they were screaming pleading with me to act before the coming cataclysm. I wasn't sure if I was tapping into some real truth or simply going mad. Maybe I already was. The final straw came after a week of ceaseless migraines and zero sleep. In the mirror, my eyes appeared blackened from burst blood vessels. My gums bled spontaneously and my fingers trembled uncontrollably. 
How long until whatever alien substance they pumped me with finally killed me? That night, as I rocked and muttered to myself, a booming voice cut through the others, commanding me, Go to the cave. Our technology can save you and your planet, but time grows short. Somehow I knew exactly the cave it meant, one I had played in as a child on family camping trips. I tore out of my house and sped recklessly into the hills until I came to that familiar rocky outcropping. A perfect full moon illuminated the small black mouth of the cave's entrance. I stumbled inside, not even questioning my surreal actions, lured by a promise of relief from the unrelenting torment. Deeper, I crawled until the narrow walls opened into a large cavern with a glowing blue light at its center. Mesmerized, I stepped toward it. The angry chorus in my head became a single high-pitched drone the closer I came to that glow. I realized my mistake too late. I had walked right into their trap. The force that seized control of my body was even greater than during the first abduction. I was a puppet, compelled by some external power to march stiffly toward that pulsing light, compelled to become something far from human. Just as my hand reached for the hypnotic light, instinct took over. I wrenched back control of my body and let out a primal scream of rage at the creatures, who thought they could dictate my fate. With the last of my energy, I ripped a sharp stone from the cavern wall and plunged it into my chest, collapsing as hot blood gushed. I lie gasping on the cold cave floor, life ebbing away. But at least I would die as myself, and not their specimen. As my vision faded, I heard their frustrated screams fade to silence. I can only pray my small act of defiance delayed their apocalypse just a while longer, so someone else might find a way to avoid the grim future preordained for our race. A future I glimpsed in my final moments. Our planet harvested, and humanity mutated into some cold new form. But perhaps we still have time to forge another path. Perhaps. The winding dirt road cut through the dark, dense forest as Andrea and I drove in uneasy silence. I had suggested we take this back road shortcut through the woods to get away for the weekend. But now regret gnawed at me as the encroaching trees and deepening dusk transformed the drive into an unsettling journey into the unknown. Andrea gazed out her window nervously as the gravel path twisted ever deeper into the gloom. Remind me why we're taking this way again? It's just a bit of scenic back road, that's all. I replied with a confidence I didn't feel. I flipped on the headlights, casting faint illumination onto the road ahead. It'll take us right to the cabin by the lake. Uh-huh, Andrea said skeptically. She was right to be apprehensive. Even I was growing uneasy, though I couldn't place why. These were just harmless rural woods, I told myself. But as we continued down the narrow lane, the forest seemed to close in oppressively. Strange noises echoed from the shadowy trees, raspy whispers, distant shrieks. It must be animals, I thought, tamping down the prickle of fear on my neck. Did you hear that? Andrea whispered, voicing my own dread. It's nothing, probably just some weird bird, I said, trying to sound casual. But then through the dense trees, I spotted a faint flickering glow up ahead. Look, there's a clearing. Let's check it out. Eager for any diversion from the creeping forest, I veered off towards the light. We parked at the edge of a large moonlit glade. Andrea peered nervously into the dark woods surrounding the open space. I have a bad feeling about this place, she began, but her words trailed off as we both stared in awe and confusion. There in the clearing stood at least two dozen ghostly figures clad in long robes and peaked hoods. Their forms glowed with an ethereal sheen, 
as they shuffled silently into a circle, carrying lit candles. Together, the phantoms began to chant in a long-forgotten tongue, their hollow voices overlapping in a hypnotic drone. What the hell? I breathed. Andrea gripped my arm, eyes fixed on the ritual unfolding before us. We huddled by the car like intruders as the candlelight illuminated the specters' shadowed faces inside their hoods. Then the tempo of the chanting quickened. The circle of entities swayed and convulsed as if building toward an occult crescendo. Andrea and I watched, paralyzed. The air buzzed with frightening energy that set my teeth on edge. We need to get out of here now, Andrea urged in a frantic whisper. Despite my fascination, I knew she was right. We were witnessing something ancient and evil that we were not meant to see. I turned the key and the car's engine roared to life, shattering the ghostly ritual's trance. The entities froze, their empty gazes finding us through the trees. Moving as one, they glided swiftly toward us, candles blowing out in a sudden gust of wind. Go! Andrea screamed. I slammed the car into gear and hit the gas, fishtailing onto the gravel road as the phantoms converged on the glade behind us. Heart pounding, I careened down the dark path until the spectral ceremony faded into the distance. At last we reached the main highway, welcomed by the glow of street lamps. The entity-infested forest lay miles behind us. Still shaken, Andrea and I continued on toward the cabin and tried to make sense of what we'd witnessed in that isolated clearing. Some ancient sect gathering to recreate their profane ceremonies, only visible under the full moon? Or ghosts eternally reenacting a dark ritual that bound them to those woods? We may never understand the secrets that lurk down winding wood drive, but we know to never again take that unholy shortcut through the forest. The entities that dwell there are not meant for living eyes. The night was dark and the road empty as I drove home from my late shift at the factory. The radio played softly but static filled the silence between songs. I yawned, exhausted after the long day's work. Just a few more miles and I'd be home to my warm bed. That's when I first heard it, a woman's voice singing. It cut through the static, an eerie, haunting melody. I turned up the radio, wondering if a new song was playing, but only white noise came through. The singing continued, wordless and distant. It seemed to come from outside the car. I drove on, puzzled. Out here on these rural back roads, there was nothing but trees and the occasional farmhouse. Where could the singing be coming from? It grew louder, like a siren's song, beckoning me onward. The voice was at once captivating and chilling. Without thinking, I began to drive faster, compelled by the hypnotic song. The voice led me down a narrow dirt road I'd never noticed before. On either side, the forest loomed dark and impenetrable. The melody spiraled higher, impossibly beautiful and yet unearthly. I should turn back, I thought vaguely, but the compulsion to follow overpowered me. The road curved and dipped until I realized I no longer knew where I was. The voice kept calling. At last, I rounded a bend and there stood an ornate iron gate, adorned with creeping ivy. It stood open, leading to a cobblestone path that disappeared into the shadows. The singing resonated all around now, at once, coming from everywhere and nowhere. Against my better judgment, I parked and stepped out of the car toward the gate. I had to find the source of the haunting song. As I passed through the gate, the singing stopped abruptly. The silence rang in my ears. The path led to the steps of a Victorian mansion that seemed abandoned. The paint peeling, the lawn withered and overgrown. Yet a faint light flickered from one curtained window. I climbed the steps to the front door. My body shook, 
equal parts fear and exhilaration. What would I find within? Again, desire compelled me to turn the tarnished knob and enter. Inside lay only gloom and a chill that raised the hairs on my arms. Cobwebs draped the furniture, and the air smelled of decay. I nearly turned to run, but then the melody began once more. It came from upstairs, a mournful refrain like a lover's lament. My gaze fixed on the winding staircase, every instinct screaming at me to flee this dreadful place. Still I climbed, one step after another. The ancient floorboards creaked underfoot as I ascended. The singing grew louder, almost directly overhead now. At the top, I found myself in a long hallway, lined with more peeling doors. Only one stood ajar, a room at the end from which the song poured. I drifted toward it, my breath shallow, my blood roaring in my ears. Reaching out with trembling fingers, I pushed open the door. Moonlight spilled in through a broken window, illuminating the crooked form of a woman in white sitting before a cracked mirror. Her long, dark hair hid her face as she combed it slowly and sang. I stood frozen. Her song had led me here, but now that I had found its source, I was terrified. Sensing my presence, the woman turned. Her gaunt face was pale as death, her eyes black pools that fixed my own. But most horrible was her mouth, impossibly wide, nearly splitting her face in two, revealing rows of jagged teeth. As her song shifted to a bone-chilling shriek, she rose like a wraith, hair writhing about her like shadowy tendrils. I turned and fled even as she glided after me, nails clawing. I stumbled down the stairs and out the front door to my car. Behind me came the shrieks as the house seemed to come to life, shuddering and swaying. I drove off in a frenzy, swerving back down the dark path until I reached the main road. The thing's cries pursued me, furious at my escape. At last I reached home, collapsing in my bed as dawn broke outside yet I still hear her ominous song in my dreams, calling me back to that nightmare manor deep in the woods. And I know one night soon, despite my terror, I will return. For her haunting melody is a siren's call I cannot resist, no matter the peril. The roadside singer awaits to make me hers forevermore. Real estate websites are a guilty pleasure of mine. There's something intriguing about scrolling through properties, imagining different lives in different places. But when I stumbled upon my childhood home listed for sale, nostalgia washed over me like a tidal wave. It was the same two-story suburban house on Maple Lane, its walls once a pale blue that mirrored the sky on a sunny day. The same place where my mom had planted roses in the garden and where my dad taught me how to fix a bike. I clicked the link, eager to explore the familiar spaces through virtual pictures. But what I found shattered my expectations. Every photo showed a burned out husk, a ruin charred black by fire, windows blown out, the remnants of a life reduced to ashes. It was my house unmistakable in its structure, but annihilated in some cataclysmic event. Confusion gripped me. How could this be? My family had moved out years ago, but we had sold the house intact, in good condition. There was no fire, no disaster that I knew of. So why did it look like this? I frantically checked the date on the listing, thinking maybe something recent had occurred. But the date only deepened the mystery. It was from years ago, before we even lived there. My heart pounded in my chest as I explored other resources. Historical photos, property records, news archives. The story was always the same. No matter how far back I went, every image showed the house as a burned ruin. It was as if history had been rewritten, 
erasing the peaceful years my family had spent there, leaving only ashes and questions. But the anomalies didn't stop there. I found an old neighborhood forum, conversations dating back to the time we lived there. People mentioned the burned house on Maple Lane, recounted legends and rumors about it being haunted, cursed. They talked about seeing strange figures in the windows, hearing whispers at night. Some claimed it had been a site of ritualistic activities, a gateway to something darker. Except I had lived there. It was my home, my sanctuary, and none of those things had ever happened. No fire, no haunting, no dark rituals. Just an ordinary house on an ordinary street. Or so I'd thought. Something compelled me to dig deeper. I contacted the current listing agent, pretending to be an interested buyer. I asked for more details, mentioned the state of the property in the pictures. The agent was perplexed. He assured me the house was in excellent condition, that there had been no fire, no damage. I pressed him to send me current photos, my pulse racing as I waited for his reply. When the photos arrived, they showed the house as I remembered it, intact, inviting, a place you could call home. Nothing like the burned ruin that seemed to exist everywhere else. Relief and horror fought for control as I grappled with this conflicting reality. Was the house on Maple Lane a burned ruin? A haunted place steeped in dark legends? Or was it the home where I grew up, where my parents laughed, and where I played with childhood friends? And what did it mean that two such disparate versions could coexist, each real in its own way, each backed by evidence that couldn't be ignored? I never bought the house. I couldn't. But I couldn't let it go, either. And so, every so often, I find myself going back to that listing, looking at those haunting pictures of a home that both was and wasn't mine. I listen for whispers in the stillness of the night, half expecting to hear the echoes of a past that might have been, a past that might yet be. I think about visiting, about standing in front of the house to see it with my own eyes. But I hesitate, afraid of what I might find, of which version will manifest for me. And the question haunts me, a riddle with no answer. Which house is real? And what will it become when its reality finally catches up with mine? The mystery remains, and the only thing I know for certain is that I'm caught in its web, suspended between two histories. Two truths, two lives, and I'm left to wonder what happens when those diverging realities finally collide.